that didn't happen. And if it did, it wasn't that bad. And if it was, that's not a big deal. And if it is, that's not my fault. And if it was, I didn't mean it. And if I did, you deserved it. How do conventional rules of logic apply to someone who is this severely self-deceived? Evidence is anecdotal, truth is malleable, and empathy can be exploited to bolster victimhood. Stronger than anything else is the selfish and short-sighted desire to hide any display of weakness, risking accountability and integrity in the long run. It's because of this that the narcissist's prayer is probably the most acknowledged rundown of the narcissistic mindset. Emotional manipulation opens the door to all kinds of nasty habits. Shifting goalposts, denial, projection, there really is no lesser evil. What follows from an unhealthy obsession with outward appearance is that lying becomes more important than admitting to a broken promise. Friends become foes, virtue becomes vice, pride becomes pity. Abusing victimhood as the ultimate defense, what remains is a need for constant public admiration and the willingness to lie in order to get it. But for how long can someone rationalize their mistakes until they start believing their own lies? Are there any methods to the madness? Or are they numb to the cause? And is there any relief for such troubled minds? Well, I invite you to find out together with me how deep the rabbit hole really goes. My name is Baxter, and you're watching Reclusive in Renton. So, what's it gonna be, you ask? Well, first I'd like to make sure I'm on the same page with you. I'll start off with an introduction to what narcissism is and what it isn't. From there, I'll get into the heart of this video and compare expert opinions to my observations. A true trial for my abductive reasoning skills. From there, I'll move on to a secret I want to let you in on. It's not really a big secret, but you deserve to know anyway. After that, I'll get into possible methods of improvement and prevention. Not just for the afflicted person in question, but also for the people around them. And I'll close with a possible prognosis and an elaboration on how I could be wrong in my reasoning. We got a lot of ground to cover, so let's get right started. Before I begin though, 1. This isn't meant to be an entertaining video. I am to educate and inform. Content this nature is difficult to listen to for longer periods of time, so please take breaks or even return later if you wish to do so. 2. Throughout the entire video I will be referring to subclinical narcissism. This means that I'm not referring to the clinical definition of narcissism, which is Narcissistic Personality Disorder or NPD for short. This disorder is a diagnosis, something only a licensed psychiatrist or psychotherapist can make. I am neither, so I am strictly referring to the subclinical definition of the word as a personality trait. 3. Any analysis conducted within this video is entirely abductive reasoning. This means that any conclusions I come to might be true, but don't necessarily have to. As stated before, I'm not a licensed psychotherapist. As such, I'm not diagnosing anyone, and neither am I conducting an anamnesis. I'm simply speculating about motivation for, intention of, and use of certain behavior. This means that any conclusions I draw are my personal opinion and do not represent any professional mental health care, opinion, or advice. 4. This video is heavily focused on audio only, so feel free to listen to it in the background. I will try to keep it visually appealing and offer short summaries where necessary and helpful. Let me tell you, narrowing down narcissistic behavior is pretty difficult. In its entirety, it encompasses so many hurtful behaviors and flawed thought patterns 
that it becomes difficult to distinguish it from other close concepts, which I will discuss later on. But if you would ask me what the most discerning feature of narcissism would be, I'd answer ego. Let's start at square one. As children, we knew absolutely nothing about the world we were born into. Danger to brain or body lurking anywhere, we adopted a layer of security to help us deal with uncertainty. We lied when we got caught stealing a cookie from the cookie jar. We cried because we didn't get the Christmas gift we wanted. We pouted because we lost a chess. Fortunately, people took pity on us at first. These reactions protected our developing sense of self. Given it's an appropriate behavior for our age, since we received a great deal of attention from our parents, it served us pretty well, at least for some time. Over the years though, we started to realize that our selfish ways didn't yield the same results as they used to. With time, people started to frown upon our demeanor. Act your age, they said. Our parents lovingly told us to understand that we live in a society where we have to be mindful of those around us. They showed us that things don't just go the way we want them to and that we have to come to terms with that. We dropped our obsolete beliefs of getting what we want, when we want, and realized that other people's time is just as valuable as our own. We, more or less, came to terms with waiting in lines and working for our pay. Losing became part of the deal. We made the best of things and accepted to find common ground instead of giving in to selfish want. We learned not just about empathy, but started to understand and respect the feelings of those close and far to us and how we impact the world with our actions and words. We started to carry our burden. We grew up and became adults. Now imagine a person who never matured into this mindset. Self-preservation becomes their priority one. Other people have their wishes and fears, but these are unimportant. What counts is if they got what they wanted. If not, insults and manipulation may follow. Building pipe dreams of power, wealth or success and deluding themselves into thinking that these dreams are reality becomes a habit. Narcissists mostly live in a lie. They are envious of those around them and deal with it by projecting their envy onto others. Such individuals see themselves as special or unique and because of their perceived overinflated status, demand special amounts of attention or admiration. When this fails, and believe me, it does fail, their entitlement and rage get the better of them. They start telling everyone that they deserve what they are owed simply because it's them. They put others down to appear superior, which only makes them look more arrogant in the process. Self-righteous, controlling, and pleased with their own folly, they like to manipulate those who want to believe their lies and ostracize anyone who gets too close to either the truth or the true ego. And don't you dare criticize them, for it is the world's fault that they became who they are. In conclusion, narcissists construct a false sense of self on top of their true fragile ego, which they try to protect at any cost. They distract from bad behavior and flaws in personality through copious amounts of mental gymnastics, illogical thought patterns, immature mental defense mechanisms and ego defenses help to deflect any criticism thrown at them. What appears confident and charming in the short run unmasks itself as insecurity and spite with just enough time. Categorizing narcissism can be as difficult as accurately describing it. It's important to be able to tell the difference between similar yet separate concepts, especially when one is more visible than the other. That's why I want you to get to know the difference between clinical and subclinical narcissism. As I've already stated in the disclaimer, it essentially comes down to talking about a mental disorder versus a personality trait. Clinical narcissism is what you can inform yourself on by reading the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, or DSM-5 for short. Here you have clear markers of behavior and cognition described as a set of symptoms. These include grandiosity, insulting arrogance, exploitation of others, 
lack of empathy for negative impact the narcissist has on other people, a fixation on fantasies of power, success or attractiveness, seeing yourself as unique or special, the need of continual admiration from others, a sense of entitlement to special treatment, and finally, intense envy of others or the belief that others are envious of the narcissist. Five of these symptoms have to appear in the afflicted person to qualify for one part of the NPD diagnosis. The other part, and a very important one at that, requires the individual to experience clear clinical distress as well as the experience of social and occupational impairment because of their symptoms. This means that they have to experience difficulties in relationships and at work because of their narcissism. And by just saying that, I can guess the confusion on your faces. You're probably asking yourself, how can a narcissist, who is essentially a constant jerk and doesn't feel bad for it ever admit that they're having problems because of their bad behavior, especially when they shift the blame of their problems onto others constantly? This is what essentially generates a big problem in the accurate diagnosis. I'm going to have to crush a lot of dreams right now by saying this, but I have to say it anyway. We can't diagnose someone simply for being a jerk. As defeatist as this sound, when someone is a dick to people constantly and doesn't feel distress or faces occupational impairment because of it, there is no diagnosis we can give them. But for every cloud exists a silver lining. Ask yourself, what good would giving a NPD diagnosis to someone do when that person is solely responsible for their inexcusable behavior which they don't feel bad for? The answer should be clear. It absolves them of everything they've done. It's explained away by identifying an unknown stressor or trauma as a vital point of manifestation for any of the symptoms mentioned before. Therefore, remind yourself that by not giving a jerk an NPD diagnosis, you don't give them an out of their bad behavior and actually call a spade a spade. As such, the requirement of the diagnosis becomes entirely obsolete to the topic I wish to discuss with you next subclinical narcissism. Also called pathological narcissism by some, subclinical narcissism in essence is a construct used in research and not a diagnosis. Because of that, it is much better understood and closer to the individual. Subclinical narcissism actually exists on a continuum in contrast to the presence or absence of clearly defined symptoms. This continuum is defined by multiple dimensions which for the sake of brevity I will reduce to two. One dimension defines the severity of narcissistic behavior. The other defines the two specific subtypes of narcissism. Yes, you heard that right. Subtypes of narcissism. Researchers such as Elsa Ronningstam, Aaron Pincus, Joshua Miller and Keith Campbell revolutionized the research field of traditional narcissism in the past 20 to 25 years and found that the typical diagnosis of narcissism is overlooking a great part of the clinical population lacking the same social aptitude as their garden variety narcissist. A number of subtypes emerged. The grandiose narcissist, the vulnerable narcissist, malignant narcissists or even communal narcissists. The most commonly discussed and popular among those are the grandiose and vulnerable narcissist also called overt and covert narcissist respectively. More on those two subtypes later on though. Coming back to subclinical narcissism, it is a more in quotation marks complete understanding of narcissism. There are no clear cut markers but a set of commonalities which are agreed upon such as the lack of empathy, grandiosity, superciliousness, arrogance, antagonism, sense of entitlement, superficiality, emotional coldness, chronic seeking of admiration, a tendency to rage and to manipulate or exploit others. To summarize, clinical narcissism is what the DSM-5 says narcissistic personality disorder is. Subclinical narcissism goes beyond that and involves new research, especially on an individual level, which has yet to find its way into the limelight. Now that you know a whole deal about this important difference, I'll move on to the equally important explanation of the overt and covert narcissistic subtypes. 
the overt narcissist, is the classical narcissist. Charismatic, cocky, confident, charming, arrogant, on top of the world, attractive, well put together, and articulate. These are the ones we associate with success, celebrity, and glamour. The grandiose narcissist derived from the traditional textbook values of clinical narcissism. Common features of the personality include diminished empathy, entitlement, grandiosity, arrogance, a chronic need for validation, and consistent admiration seeking, vanity and superficiality, rage, hypersensitivity in the face of criticism, difficulties with disappointment, and fantasies of success, pleasure, or profit. In the workplace, overt narcissists display an exaggerated sense of self-importance, believe in their brilliance and superiority. They commonly seek to ascend hierarchies in the shortest way possible and just don't care about exploiting others and establishing their unrivaled dominance while they rise to the top. Overt narcissists tend to get bored easily and early in relationships due to their ego inflation and infatuation with themselves. When conversations don't revolve around them, their attention goes elsewhere. Good first impressions are what they excel at though. Thanks to their low approach avoidance, high extroversion, and especially because of their overconfidence, they can appear larger than life. The difference to true confidence lies within the humility. Overt narcissists brag a lot about themselves and their accomplishments, while confident people don't feel the need to flaunt their CV everywhere they go. While these type of narcissists tend to look very good on paper, the longer you spend time with them, you start to realize that there are underlying issues with their behavior and outwards appearance as they constantly oversell themselves and are willing to bend the rules to get ahead. They play on the trifecta of hope, fear, and guilt to keep their partner stuck with them. Hope that things will go back to the good old days at the start of the relationship. Fear that by leaving the narcissist, their partner will end up forever alone. And guilt that divorcing the narcissist would end up ruining them, their reputation, and their life. Their superficiality makes them frequent cheaters on their partners, while they will gaslight them about their extra martial affairs. Next to that, overt narcissists will seem preoccupied with their appearance and might acquire a lot of status symbols to appear successful. Despite all this, they can be pleasant people to have around until you witness one of their tantrums making you painfully aware of their underlying issues. In contrast to the pretentious and outgoing narcissist, the more introverted, vulnerable, or covert narcissist displays poor social skills and a more sullen grandiosity. As the name suggests, they appear as vulnerable, victimized, sullen, socially less skilled, anxious, and resentful narcissists. Common personality traits include emotional coldness, social inexperience, insecurity, chronic dissatisfaction, entitlement, sullenness, lack of insight, envy or the projection of it, and manipulation through guilt. These individuals often present themselves as someone who is depressed, needy, irritable, hostile, or sad, while still remaining narcissistic at heart, meaning they display the same themes as their overt counterparts, albeit looking and feeling somewhat different. Their sullen grandiosity I mentioned shows itself in a more backdoor way. For example, I would have been great if the world wouldn't have denied me my popularity. Or, I would have been more successful if I had just received more opportunities for sponsorships that you get so easily nowadays. Or, I don't have to show up for an hourly work job. This is beneath me. When it comes to their sense of entitlement, it also appears more victimized. An example, I shouldn't have to take time for this class since I'm smarter than my professor. Arrogance is displaying itself as all the gifts and talents they have that they never receive validation or admiration for. Additionally, they will easily dismiss the opinions and valuable knowledge of other people. They constantly seek the admiration of others and will viciously criticize experts in their line of work, 
stating that the covert narcissist knows better than anyone. Inevitably, the covert narcissist will spend most of his time at home, reminiscing back to the good old days or brooding about their missing chance to return to greatness. They grow ever more impatient, angry and sullen the longer they have to wait as their peers are succeeding in ways the narcissist isn't. As a result, they will start to dismiss or refuse to acknowledge the hard work and effort others put into their jobs to reach their respective levels of success. Falling victim to countless logical fallacies, covert narcissists will start to attribute the success of others to good luck, meaning minimizing honest efforts, and their own failure to bad luck, meaning they show a lack of control over their lack of effort. They start to believe that the world is out to get them. Because of this, they become chronic malcontents who are never satisfied with anything. Every inkling of success will be overemphasized and every gross mistake glossed over. This type of narcissist will display their moodiness as constant criticism, complaining, anger, contempt, dismissiveness or frustration. They seem to complain about everything, making life even more miserable in the process. In general, covert narcissists appear more passive-aggressive, more sullen and less obvious to the observer. This increases their potential to engage in effective emotional manipulation. Their hypersensitivity to criticism will make them more likely to lash out at others and tell everyone how badly the world treated them. Everything somehow relates back to them. Asking them to move past their victimhood will end either in excuses or more rage. These narcissists tend to be very judgmental and often fall victim to their own traps and arguments by exposing their double standards and their lack of self-awareness. You often get the feeling that these people think they are owed more than they already own, which fuels their toxicity. They exploit people rather implicitly as they tend to manipulate people through their victimhood, passive aggressiveness or even sense of guilt. Gaslighting next to outright lying is also common practice, even when the lie has already been uncovered as such. At the end, both egos are so entangled with each other, even the covert narcissist doesn't know who to be anymore. At this point, they become dependent on the opinion of others what type of person they should be. Sounds familiar? I know what you're thinking, but before we get into the core of this video, there's one final thing I need you to get familiar with, and it's a personal pet peeve of mine. I want to introduce you to the dark triad, so you can effectively distinguish narcissism from other personality traits close to it. In short, the dark triad is a subclinical model comprised of three personality traits, psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and narcissism. These traits appear together because of their large overlap and their malevolent potential, hence the quality of dark. I went over narcissism in great detail and I don't want to overburden you with more information than you need to, so we got that one covered. Psychopathy is described as a collection of antisocial and egotistical behaviors. Individuals who are psychopathic act very self-serving, recklessly disregarding others and their safety. Acting impulsive and with callousness, their lack of empathy enables psychopaths to be highly manipulative. They often live on the fringes of society since they are tricking people left and right and need to be on the move constantly to not get discovered. They love both the hunt and being hunted. It's a sick twisted game they like to play for their enjoyment. Psychopaths are often superficially charming, chronically bored and infatuated with themselves. They can be best described as cold-blooded killer, someone who feels absolutely no regret, remorse or guilt to kill a person if it furthers their goal. The kind of people who could stay calm and composed with their murder victim in their trunk while a cop is pulling them over for a broken rear light. Psychopaths lack the ability to feel fear because of a neurological dysfunction in their autonomous nervous system caused by genetics. This malfunction combined with their character traits makes them great serial killers and or equally successful CEOs. There's an easy rule to remember when it comes to differentiating narcissism and psychopathy. 
Pathological lying is common among both of these traits. While a narcissist lies to make others perceive them in a better light, they would never lie to appear worse in the eye of the public. In contrast, the psychopath would do exactly this, given it furthers the goal. General psychopathy is divided into two factors, and you just got to know factor 1 psychopathy. Sociopathy, or factor 2 psychopathy, is described differently. One distinction to make is that psychopaths are born and sociopaths are made, meaning they are a product of their environment. The sociopathic individual is much more impulsive, sensation-seeking, erratic, and anger-prone than their psychopathic counterparts. Sociopathy is clinically defined as an antisocial personality disorder, or ASPD for short. While psychopaths completely lack any capability for genuine emotional attachment and use shallow relationships to appear normal to avoid possible detection, sociopaths are capable of feeling a minor form of emotional attachment which they wish to exploit. As a last point of distinction, the criminal history of sociopaths is generally more spur of the moment rather than care for premediation because of their overly emotional, erratic, and irresponsible behavior. Finally, Machiavellianism is a personality trait which can be summarized by immoral and opportunistic personal gain. Individuals high on this trait simply are master manipulators. They are very detached from feeling deep emotions since guilt or shame would just complicate things. Their motivation can be summarized by a little extra harm will go unnoticed or everyone is a criminal but only the stupid ones get caught. Individuals with Machiavellianism like to exploit others for power, money, but generally not fame. Machiavellians enjoy keeping people in the dark about their intentions and plans. Fame would compromise their secrecy. Criticism of their behavior is generally ignored as they only look out for themselves. Just like psychopaths, they have the potential to commit serious crimes, but Machiavellians carefully weigh the consequences of such behavior. They also fake guilt or flattery for their gain and, in contrast to psychopathy and narcissism, consider long-term planning useful. The goal-oriented Machiavellian is as such very low in impulsivity and quite patient when it comes to sitting things out. That was a lot, but we made it to the end of the first part. Here's your recap before we move on. 1. Narcissism is a cluster of personality traits, thought patterns, and behaviors which are commonly associated with arrogance, a sense of entitlement, envy, emotional manipulation, exploitation, hypersensitivity to criticism, and constantly seeking admiration. 2. Narcissists build up and live in a fantasy. They protect their true, fragile ego by constructing a false sense of self over it and deceive themselves into being that false sense of self. They are masters at self-deception. 3. Narcissism runs on a continuum. People can vary in symptomatic display as well as the severity of their behavior. Less narcissism encountered generally predicts a better prognosis. 4. Know the difference between clinical and subclinical narcissism. The former is a diagnosis, the latter a personality trait. 5. Subtypes of narcissism. Overt and covert subtypes are both narcissism, but in slightly different ways, separated by the individual's extroversion or lack thereof. 6. Overt narcissists are the stereotype you know from every textbook definition. Covert narcissists are more hidden or sullen. They think the world owes them and they demand it with the same entitlement as their overt counterparts. 7. Subtypes are not mutually exclusive and run on a continuum. Overt features can appear in covert narcissists and vice versa. Individuals commonly oscillate between these two subtypes depending on the mood and are neither 100% one or the other. 8. Narcissism is part of the dark triad, overlapping with psychopathy, sociopathy, and Machiavellianism. All those traits have their subtle differences despite their overlap with each other, and exhibiting one trait doesn't necessarily predict 
that you also have the other. I would like to thank the following people for their tireless effort in educating the masses on topics of mental health. Abdul Saad, Dr. Les Carter, Dr. Ramani Durvasula, Dr. Jordan Peterson, and Dr. Todd Grande. You will see many clips of all of them throughout this part. If the previous part were the introduction to a scientific paper, this one would be hypothesis, methods, and results in one. Everything I've covered so far, every abstract concept you might or might not have heard about before, will now manifest itself in observable behaviors and tangible evidence. You've read the title. You know who this is about. Our infamous video game streamer, Darkseid Phil, or DSP for short. Before I start, I want to make one thing clear. DSP is in my opinion, neither a psychopath nor a sociopath. I see no indicators of long-term planning in him, as he's looking for the quick way to fame and popularity, which leaves Machiavellianism out of the question. And I refuse to believe that DSP is someone who would fit the bill for conduct disorder, a prerequisite for being diagnosed as a sociopath. These people are malevolent schemers always two steps ahead of you. The kind of people to make you responsible for that bad relationship so they can be messaging you about the affair they had the entire time, sending you nasty texts after you broke up in order to see your emotional hurt. As such, sociopaths will be well known quickly among a lot of people, forcing them to be constantly on the move, sometimes on the fringes of society, in order to trick people into getting what they want. I don't see DSP as that kind of person. The only thing I can agree with is the observation of him acting in a sociopathic way since narcissism and sociopathy overlap quite a lot. Detecting narcissism can be quite the eye-opening experience for victims of such behavior. An excellent analogy was given by Dr. Todd Grande. So an analogy here would be if somebody had trouble sleeping or they were irritable or maybe a little down when they're in their house but not when they're outside of their house. And then maybe years later, this is going on for years, they find out there was some sort of chemical leak in their home. So after hearing about this, they remember that they always did kind of smell something funny in the house. And all those other symptoms start to make sense in light of that chemical leak. And again, they tend to correspond with the time someone spent in their home, right? So that new information kind of aligns all of those symptoms. Everything makes sense in light of that new information. This is really how narcissism is. Narcissism is like a chemical leak. Subtle, but dangerous. And when it's finally discovered, it really explains a lot. And I have to strongly agree here. Once I started researching more and more, I realized a lot of the indicators for narcissistic behavior seemed to align with our video gaming enthusiast, Philip Bernal. I started to see how narcissism explained a great deal of his behavior and thinking. I could accurately predict how he would act in certain situations. This is where my abductive reasoning skills come to shine. For those unaware of what that is, it means that you go by a set of observations and infer to the simplest and most likely explanation. The explanation doesn't necessarily have to be true though. By using abductive reasoning, I compare DSP's observable behavior on stream and social media to narcissistic behavior observed in both clinical research and psychotherapy. I am aware that both situations are not equal in terms of comparability, but since this is one of the sole ways to gain insight into DSP's behavior and thinking, I will risk this inequality for the lack of a better alternative. For the sake of brevity, I will only include a maximum of three examples for every observable behavior or important subtopic. More often than not, this means I may have more than three examples in total, but only chose the most damning in my opinion. Some clips might show up repeatedly since they might display multiple markers of narcissistic behavior at once. Where necessary, 
I will give more context to a situation and try to explain motivation behind or intention for certain behavior. As a personal goal, I also refrain from using any footage before DSPs move close to Seattle, just to show that these examples are all fairly recent. I pick 25 indicators I deem relevant in a personal list of covert narcissistic behavior. Here goes nothing. Number 1 Grandiosity contributes a lot to narcissism, since many narcissists view themselves as superior to others. It is defined as an unrealistic sense of superiority, characterized by a sustained view of oneself to be better than other people. This is expressed by either putting yourself above others or putting others below you. We have a grandiose sense of self-importance. So a lot of times we see this manifested through exaggerating and otherwise lying. So an example would be if somebody wins a competition or an award, say at work, like an award that's given every year for doing something particular, some task or achieving some level of productivity. An individual who has this symptom may make it appear that their winning of that award was more substantial than when somebody else won the award in previous years. They distinguish between the similar awards or the same awards using hardships or characteristics that made it more difficult for them to get. So it's really an exaggeration and in many cases a lie that feeds back into this grandiose sense of self-importance. My autograph alone to some people is worth more than anything that Tevin will ever do in his entire fucking life. So choke on that, bitch. And that was it. So I was the top placing American that year. It was actually three Japanese players above me. And then I was right under there. So I was fourth place. But I was the top placing American in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo that year. So technically I was the best ranked Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo player that year. And it sucks. It really does. It sucks because you're right. Like, I, I really feel that if I had been put into a giant position of like power, like PewDiePie was, I probably would have done a better job. I'm just saying, and I'm not saying, you know, anything about money or whatever. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm smarter than that. Unique to covert narcissists is the fact that their grandiosity is expressed in more hidden ways. The other point I want to make about the grandiosity of the covert narcissist, where, which hides their grandiosity, is that the grandiosity of the covert narcissist is, is what I call it's constructed in the negative. Whereas the grandiosity of the overt uh, charming narcissist is constructed in the positive. So what they are, they're selling themselves, they're marketing themselves. Hey, this is what I am. It's flashy, it's colorful, it's exuberant. Whereas the grandiosity of the covert narcissist is, is constructed in the negative, it's hidden. It's latent, it's unfulfilled. It's largely about what could have been, what I could have accomplished if I was more well known, if people appreciated me, if people gave me the reverence that I deserve. So there's a real focus here on the uh, perception of their specialness, which at some level has not been fully fulfilled. But I wouldn't be in this situation now if it weren't for the horrendously bad things that happened to me, you know, four plus years ago. So it's kind of like, oh, now be happy that I get troll attention. Why should I be happy? I wouldn't be in this position if it weren't for the trolls to begin with. You see what I mean? So it's kind of hard for me to be happy for it. And how me our memes hurtful. Because there's a meme out there that something that happened literally didn't happen. You know? And turning something that happened into something that didn't and making people believe it is fucked up. Because now I've lost out on so many opportunities that I should have rightfully have because I, what you're saying happened didn't happen. And that's harmful to me, to my business, to my livelihood, to, to my wife, to everyone, because you fucked around and lied about me, you know? That's fucked up. And admittedly, it's a lot harder because I have so many shithead assholes following me around, constantly harassing me, threatening me. And I am where I am right now in my level of popularity because of the level of harassment that I've gotten over the years. If I never had this bandwagon mentality of people, oh, it's fun to make fun of Phil, keep doing it, I probably would be way more popular and I'd be in a position, a bigger position, uh, not to say that I would be a top guy, 
but I certainly would probably be at least in a mid-level position of people who are content creators. I wouldn't be bottom of the barrel, you know? Closely related to grandiosity is the concept of hubris or foolish pride. Here are some examples resembling hubris in DSP. When you have that strong hubris on the inside of you, you have a mindset that says, nobody tells me what to do. Put the word to the dollar. He says, find a better way to do this. It's annoying to hear you go, I can't do it, then stare at chat, wait for an answer. Uh, no. I'll do how I want, and if you don't like it, you can go fucking watch somebody else or do it yourself. Jesus. Tell me what to do on my own fucking stream. How about you shut up? How about you shut your face? How about that? Okay, ready? Okay, uh, by the way, I'm done now with Care Bear Killer. I really am. Um, they basically, this person in stream chat, and I'm not trying to be negative or nothing, but this person literally contradicts the stuff I say on a daily basis and is very, very negative in the stream chat all the time. Uh, now they're trying to tell me, I'm a 10 year YouTuber. I have had more experience with copyright than anyone else. All right. I have worked with multiple MCNs. I've worked directly with YouTube telling me I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to copyright. Goodbye. That's it. That's the last straw. <laughs> that really is it. Like, you're going to tell me, the person who's dealt with this kind of abuse and dealt directly with YouTube and two different MCNs over the years, that I don't know what I'm talking about. You can now take a step outside the chat and we don't need to see you anymore. That's it. I'm done. That's, that's it. You're going to tell me. I don't know what I'm talking about, and I'm spreading misinformation in my own stream chat, and you're negative influence on the stream chat every day, and you think I'm gonna let you get away with it. Good night. Good night and good luck. <laughs> Tweet from October 26th, 2018. There is nothing you can teach me. I was making Let's Play videos for two years before anyone could make a dime doing so. I will single-handedly saw the industry turn from honest gamer to over-positive shills getting preferential treatment, and I've refused to be part of that process. I feel no need to apologize. And while we're on the subject, I feel no need to ask for forgiveness. That's what hubris takes a person to. Back in 2019, DSP jumped on the pro Jared hate bandwagon because someone informed him of a harmless tweet pro Jared made about DSP in 2015. It reads, I took a wrong turn on in the internet and ended up reading DSP hilarity. Haha, <laughs> whoops. DSP was aware of all the allegations against Pro Jared at that time and swung back by both explicitly and implicitly referencing Pro Jared and his circumstances multiple times. DSP mocked Pro Jared's original tweet by sarcastically transforming it to fit Jared's newfound attention. Quote, took a day off from the entire internet, but Pro Jared hilarity was at the top of everyone's Twitter feed. Haha. <laughs> Whoops. Later in 2019, Progerit effectively uncancelled himself and gained the trust of his subscribers back. DSP, of course, wants to hear nothing about that and tells his viewers that he shouldn't have to apologize for something he felt justified to do. And have I apologized to Progerit after I went out of him? No, because I never insulted him for any of the slander against him at all. I insulted him because he insulted me for no reason. I didn't know who the fuck he was. And this guy just insults me publicly years ago on Twitter, being a complete douchebag, okay? So all I did was said general things on Twitter and everyone assumed that I was like insulting him when I never even once tagged him in my tweets. And I'm not apologizing to someone who purposely insulted me years ago to get at me for a cheap fucking jab when I never insulted the guy at all, so he can go fuck himself. And by the way, I don't believe that all of it was slander and a lie at all either. I don't believe that for a second. <clears throat> In 2018, DSP's viewers voted for him to replay Silent Hill 2 on hard difficulty. When facing difficulties almost immediately, he lashed out at his viewers, insulting them in many ways. Like, why the fuck would you ask me to play this on hard unless you're a complete asshole? And I mean that. And yes, that douche kid, if you recommend that I play this on hard and demanded it, whining in the stream chat, you must play this on hard or, we don't, or we're not gonna watch, yes, you're a dick. You are. Because you knew that it was this ridiculously difficult and it wouldn't be fun for me, and you did it anyway to be dickheads. So yeah, you are a dick if you did demand that I play this on hard, because this sucks. This is not fun at all. The next day, he seemed to want to apologize, only to half-ass his apology instead of accepting the full responsibility for his actions. And I'm like, well, fuck, I was trying to have fun, now I'm angered, and you know, it comes across in the content, and it shouldn't, you know. This should be, you guys come here, 
to hang out with me and have fun. You know what I mean? And and chill out and relax and and have a laugh sometimes uh, you know with me and sometimes at my expense and either is fine in my opinion. And you know, I shouldn't let that happen. And so I do apologize again to anyone who was maybe offended by my agitated comments on Tuesday when I was raging about the difficulty of the game and people being assholes for making me play it at that difficulty, okay? Everyone's angry because I banned Jake. I banned Jake temporarily because he said, and I quote, the reason that people hate on me and the detractors follow me around is because I won't apologize. I don't know these people. I don't know the people who stalk me and do nasty shit to me. So yes, all the nasty things that happen to me in my life is because I won't apologize. My whole life is in shambles financially. Things are going terrible. Uh, I can't collab with anyone on the internet. You know, I can't do the same things all the other successful Twitch streamers do. Let's blame Phil for it and say it's because he won't say he's sorry. Sorry for fucking what? Seriously, when I see shit like that, that pisses me off. Because that's just complete lack of any awareness of any fucking semblance of reality. Or they may say something like, uh, if I mock you, or if I ridicule you, or if I am condescending to you, well, you deserve it. And, and, and besides coming from me, it's not wrong uh, because I'm so correct anyway. In 2017, a viewer named Wardog Leader entered DSP's chat while he was feeling bad and complaining about how difficult life is. Wardog Leader remarked that his brother recently passed and how he supports the notion that his life goes on and made suggestions on how DSP could easily prepare quick meals. DSP is immediately suspect of Wardrock Leader, implies that he's dishonest about his brother's death and that he wants to derail the stream. DSP says that Wardrock Leader is trying to make DSP look bad, bans him, tells him to run his own stream because he seems to cope better with stress, and calls him king of suffering. War dog leader, there's no way for us to know if what you're saying in the stream chat is legitimate or not. You could be someone completely making stuff up or you could be completely legitimate. Appreciate the sentiment and sorry to hear about a family member that passed away, but no one wants to hear you make this about how I'm in the wrong for being stressed in my life because you have a situation that's worse. Um, that's ridiculous. Go run your own stream if you want to do that. We don't, you know what I mean? Like he's trying to make me look like a villain because he says someone passed away and he's doing better than me. Go ahead, you know what? Officially for tonight's stream, you're the king of suffering. <laughs> You're the king of suffering. Good for you. Thanks for coming in and making yourself, propped yourself up on my stream. We really needed that, really. Okay, and now Wardog has earned himself a ban because it's obvious either he's a troll or he's just someone who is just going to be here to derail everything and tough shit. Goodbye. In a later video, he lies about the situation and tells everyone who is not believing him to go fuck themselves instead of apologizing for not handling this delicate situation gracefully. I call him out, but because I call him out, I'm the villain, right? Go fuck yourself. No, really. If you're that close-minded to that stupid of a person to think that, number one, that guy was telling the truth, and number two, that someone who's taking their own personal relative's death as a way to make them look better than me on my stream, when people are asking me what's been going on with me, why did I miss a stream, and make me look like a weakling or a villain, you think I'm the villain? Go fuck yourself. You're an idiot, and if you believe that stupid shit, go right ahead and believe it, because you're going to go right along with the millions of gullible idiots out there who believe everything they're fucking told. Seriously, it was obvious troll bait. Ben Shears, a great thing for you to do would be stop calling people idiots and morons. You never take the higher road. Well, here's the thing, all right? People insult me every single day a million times, right? All I do is defend myself. So all, if you're saying I shouldn't call him an idiot or a moron, Okay, what should I just do? Say, gee, thanks for insulting me. You're 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 really mean, and you know, at least if you if you you strike back, at least it doesn't feel like you're trying to be victim complex constantly. Cause I'm not, you know. I understand that people constantly attack me or whatever. I'm not trying to do a victim complex here or anything. Uh, I I'm not super thin skinned Phil where I can't take an uh, an insult. But at the same time, I should have the right to defend myself. So I don't know why you think that if someone outright insults me, why I can't go back and call them exactly what they are. You know, are we really in this really, this pussy ass society in 2020 that you can't even just rational, rationally defend yourself from this kind of behavior? I don't think so. I at least like to believe not so that maybe, you know, we're better than that. So when someone asks you a genuine question you don't like, why do you do a mocking voice if you don't like the question? You always say you don't like when people make fun of you, but you make fun of them, why? Because stupid people should be made fun of stupidly. As an interesting side note, I'd like to add that narcissists often believe their views are inherently superior to other people's perspectives. What they truly value though, is the attention they receive for holding those views. It is comparable to wearing opinions 
like a vest you might say, to look good, but risking contradiction later on. Number 2 Narcissists love to blame a multitude of reasons for their own shortcomings. It is virtually impossible for them to take responsibility, even if it seems like they are. Most of the time, it's insincere and only to keep their face and not for genuine commitment to change. Instead, they have become seduced by the blame game, which bolsters their sense of uniqueness and hidden grandiosity, as I uh, detailed in last week's video. They feel victimized, they feel under-recognized, uh, their, their, their brilliance and their talents are under-recognized and unfulfilled, owing to factors outside of themselves, from their uh, standpoint. That was up kicks, didn't come out, because of the lag, or not the lag, the uh, speed. Yep. I can't get this fucking moves to come out because of the fucking speed is too fast. I'm sick of this asshole, get rid of him. I guess I got kicked even though I didn't do anything, I was dead. You saw that, right? It showed me dying, then it showed me shooting someone in, on my team. You saw that, right? But I didn't do that. I got hit by a bullet and died, then it showed me firing, so the game entire sync fucked up. Because I died first, I never even fired yet. And then next thing you know, I'm, I'm shooting the guy in front of me. <laughs> what a stupid fucking game. Right it's beside the house. Well, I don't know how he knew I was in there at all. There's no way he could have known unless he was stream sniping. So he must have been a stream sniper watching the fucking stream. Because how else would you know I'm in there? <laughs> well, nothing I could do about it. Amazing gameplay of a cheater. I love it. Use the sensor? I didn't move, so the sensor wouldn't have fucking worked, stupid. <laughs> I know what you're thinking. How is DSP being a bad sport any evidence for him blaming people for his own shortcomings? Many people can't deal with the frustration of losing in a video game. Are they all narcissistic because of this? No, they're obviously not. But DSP blames a lot of things outside of video games for his problems as well. And I was stupid. By the way, I've said this a million times, there was no guidelines back then of how to be an internet personality. How to do it right and not make mistakes and hurt other people and piss people off. None of that. I was the, one of the first guys to actually do it like I did. I know that putting that out on Twitter is going to cause trouble. I know that logically in this head. I know that's stupid, you know, but I did it anyway. And it wasn't a mistake. It wasn't a mistake that I put that on fucking Twitter. No, sir, it wasn't. That was my depression pulling me out of a positive moment of my life at that very moment maybe just maybe people need to stop being these crazy add attention seeking you know viewers who oh my god oh my god action everywhere explosions everywhere these be next gen graphics everywhere everywhere oh uh. throwback games can be fun man why is it that games like this have an audience but when i try to play them people complain and don't want to watch why does everyone else get to enjoy indie games but not me fuck that seriously fuck that shit Number 3. Covert narcissists are very sensitive to any form of criticism against them, as it is interpreted as an attack on their true, fragile ego. This is not often the case with overt narcissists. Now there is a tremendous hypersensitivity observed in covert narcissism. In fact, this hypersensitivity to any kind of feedback, this is one of the patterns that will emerge in a relationship with a covert narcissist early on. They will often be lashing out at the world and always saying how unfair the world is. But one fine day, when you decide that you are done with watching them sitting there acting like a victim all the time, and you just say, you know what, just do something. Instead of complaining, just do something. They will typically react with absolute rage. They are very vulnerable in the face of any kind of feedback, constructive criticism, anything like that. And their hypersensitivity in the face of that can look almost like paranoia. 
they truly believe that everyone is out to get them and they live their lives in line with that assumption. They really walk around saying, the world is against me. Okay. You're just gonna sit here and complain constantly about the commentary? Then don't then don't be here. Goodbye. Seriously, someone's just sitting there. It commentary sucks, it's too big. Shut the fuck up. I'm playing a platform or trying to concentrate. What should I do? Be telling you about some fucking stories from my past and I try to fucking play this super hard platformer? How about this? Eat a dick and get the fuck out. Jesus Christ, some people, man. Shouldn't you just have thicker skin and not let what teenagers say about you online mean anything? Wait a minute. So all I'm doing is I'm putting out a gameplay stream, right? It's a fun gameplay stream. It's meant to be a fun interactive thing where we just hang out and have a good time playing a video game. People come into that stream and insult me and make up slanderous, disgusting things, defamatory statements, real nasty shit, and they throw it all at me. Oh, shame on you for letting that get to you. What? What about the people who did it? How about we actually go to the root of the problem? The mercilessly unconscious, conscionable shitheads who have, they have no morality, no feelings of right and wrong inside of them. They think that, that insulting people and doing nasty shit is like, okay. Why are you going to blame the person who was insulted for letting you get to them? How about you blame the people who were insulting in the fucking first place? Alright, Third Eye the Third, you should really watch what you say because I'm about to ban you again. I seriously am. You're such an idiot for saying what you just said in the stream chat. I'm not even going to fucking repeat it. I'm seriously not going to repeat it. You think being a fucking paid shill equates to working hard? You're an asshole. You can tell me someone like me didn't work hard, but just because I'm an outspoken guy who's always honest over the years, that I didn't work hard, but these fucking paid shills did? You're a fucking asshole. <laughs> you're talking to the wrong person, and you're in the wrong fucking stream. Number four. As narcissists see themselves better as others, they also believe that they are special or unique individuals. The third symptom criterion is this idea that the individual feels special, unique, and only high status people or other special or unique people could understand them. So really this symptom criterion ties in with arrogance, which is the last symptom criterion. Now, important point about this symptom criterion is it's not always necessarily a positive way of being special. Oftentimes it is. Oftentimes it's special as in somebody has the highest level of performance, they have the most money, they have the most physical beauty. But sometimes it's more of a wounded hero effect where they're special because they have some sort of emotional struggle or emotional damage and only certain people can relate to that damage. So this sometimes really manifests more in a way of looking for attention for being sensitive or emotionally special, not always, as I mentioned, in a positive way. I'm the guy who can actually be honest with you and tell you what I feel and not have to worry about any repercussions from a sponsor or any repercussions where people won't come back to my streams to see that game because there's a million other games right around the corner I can play. I'm in a very unique position. I'm In a, in a lot of ways, I, I consider myself lucky. I like having the freedom I have. I like not having to bow down to any particular authority figure and, and do something to make a paycheck. That's a good thing, right? <laughs> no, like, once you're oversaturated, you're oversaturated. You know what I mean? I'm just happy to have gotten in at a time when, you know, I can actually get attention for what I'm doing and not be, feel like I'm lost in the shuffle. And I'm unique enough because I've been around long enough and I have a reputation, although it may not be a good one, I still have a reputation and people want to see what the hell I'm doing with new releases and they want to tune in and see what fills up to. And that's a good thing. I've told you guys a million times, I don't see myself as anything special or important. That I never thought that I was like, oh, I'm some special content creator and I deserve extra treatment or I deserve something special other than other people. Why do you think when all the other YouTubers, all right, we're, we're all getting into these exclusive marketing partnerships with the companies to get these games early and shit. I was lining up outside of GameStop at midnight like everyone else to buy them, right? You heard that right. I'm actually torn on this. On one side, DSP is clearly behaving like an individual who sees themselves as special or unique. He ignores his own streaming rules, treats people badly if they don't help him or others immediately, and demands that multiple issues he faces to be swiftly escalated to managers. That's what a Karen does. Here's one clip in line with what Dr. Grande mentioned, 
where DSP makes only depressed people relatable to his struggles in life. And Dean J to me two bucks says, I watched your recent hate live and so your segment on depression and your experiences. It resonated with me. Thanks for raising more awareness and good shit. Well, thank you very much for that Dean J. I got a lot of hate for it, Dean J, because there's people out there who hate my guts and accuse me of being disingenuous and making the whole fucking thing up. The thing is, those who actually have the disorder know that I was serious because a lot of the things that I said are true because it's things we've all experienced. Number five. Where there's special treatment, there's entitlement. Narcissists act as if they deserve lots of narcissistic supply from others, simply because it's them. You owe me. You see, if, if they ever do anything nice to you, and so they, they try to at least sometimes uh, uh, put some things out there that seem helpful and nice and good, but again, it's all part of the, uh, the manipulation sc uh, scheme. If they do something nice, then you can pretty much guess there's a hook on the back side of it. It's like, now that I've done something nice for you, or now that I've shown myself to be a really terrific person, what are you going to do for me? How are you going to make my life better? Because, well, I mean, you should, because you ought to be grateful for me. You owe me. Uh, anything that uh, that's nice here, it's, it's because of me. The covert narcissist, though, ultimately will get to the point where they feel the world owes them something. Mm. The world owes me. And there'll be a real edge to them, you know, because they, but it is, they seem really sad and you'll often try to help them and you'll wonder why they're so ungrateful. Here, DSP acts both frustrated and petulant towards his viewers, demanding he'll be told how to defeat a boss he can't defeat by himself. Instead of trying to find a solution, he blocks and derails the stream until he gets a satisfactory answer. What's the point? All right, I'm done. Until someone actually tells me how to beat it, I'm just going to sit here with my hands folded. There's no point. It's a puzzle boss. There's no ch it's not challenging. It's a garbage puzzle. You don't know what to do. I'm exposing a tweet point. Unloading all my ammo into it is not dying. I don't care. Not until someone tells me what to do. I'm not going to play anymore. I'm just going to sit here. The same thing happens in the next clip. Instead of taking action himself, he demands attention from his mods by derailing the stream and refusing to continue until his issue has been addressed and fixed. By the way, can we please have the mods take an eye at the stream chat to people in there saying disgusting stuff? And I don't want to have to stop my stream constantly to moderate. I would ask, I know there's a few mods here, please give a look. Right now I'm staring at someone insulting my wife. It would be nice if someone could take care of that rather than me. Thank you, please. Someone? Anyone? Hello? Hello? McFly? Hello? Bueller? 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 Is no one here? There were mods earlier. I know for a fact there were mods here earlier. Because truth of the matter is, I'm owed a lot of fucking positivity in my life. I'm really, you know, the fact that every day I'm harassed, that my wife is attacked, that I've got my personal life in shambles because of these fucking people and what they've done for me. Karma owes me huge. I hope karma comes fucking calling because I'm going to win the lotto. It's that simple. <laughs> you know, seriously. So I am not fucking worried whatsoever. Let karma come on and do whatever it needs to do because uh, I am owed some positivity in my life after the years of fucking systematic fucked up harassment that I've gotten from really messed up people across the globe. Another facet of entitlement. DSP will blame mistakes he makes on him being just human while the mistakes of others are the consequence of their terrible personalities. But if they make the same error, if they say something that they feel that they they know wasn't right then they'll say oh i'm just a human being sometimes i make mistakes entitlement means no rules for them but the right for them to do as they want and that can be angering flawed and i mess up all the time and i do stupid shit. i know that i never said i'm an infallible i know now as i get older and i'm wiser that i constantly make mistakes that i need to improve upon right that i 100% acknowledge that I've made tons of mistakes over the years and that's one of the major reasons I'm in the situation I'm in. Please understand that. I'm not infallible. 
It's not, everyone makes the thing, oh, what is it? Um, I did nothing wrong, I did everything correct. That's not my attitude, at least not anymore. Yeah. And I feel that I've tried to actively become a better person, that I, I try to be responsible now with the things I say and do on a daily basis. Um, and even though sometimes I still probably make mistakes regularly because I'm human, and I, you know, at least now, when I'm called out for those mistakes, I've tried to fess up to them. You're right, I fucked up, I shouldn't have said that, I said the wrong thing, you know. Number six. Narcissists are very self-referential individuals. Most things somehow relate back to them. Not being the center of a conversation is a conflict for them. They compensate for this by constantly referencing to themselves. Because the grandiosity fundamentally manifests in how self-referencing this individual is. It is all about them their thoughts, their feelings, their sensitivities, their opinions. You keep getting scam calls? Dude, I got some crazy scam calls recently. I'll tell you in a second. Hold on, let me start recording. <laughs> Alright, so it's time for hour two of Blackout. People in the stream chat were just talking about getting scam phone calls. I've been getting some wild scam phone calls. I got one the other day, it was from an answering machine. It wasn't an actual person, it was a robot. The server says he will be at an anime convention this weekend. That's cool. It's been a long time since I've been to a convention. Fuck. The last time, I think Emerald City Comic Con, and that was in like 2015 or 2016. I can't even remember anymore. Three, three, out, out. Perfect. Three, and one, two, three. He's out. You know, maybe one day I'll get back to a better financial position where I won't have to stream every single day and I'll be able to go somewhere with Cat, like a convention, you know, like PAX or. That Emerald City Comic got something. I don't know. Maybe someday, but <laughs> not anytime soon. Wow. Sambuka shoot again. He said, I got a bonus for my employer. I might also be losing my job. It's a crazy time. You got a bonus, but you might lose your job. Is it that kind of like... <laughs> That's just like me. I got a commendation. I actually got a big commendation at my job. A big special, you know, certificate that said you went above and beyond. And then two months later, they laid me off. Fucking idiots. You want to hear the ridiculous explanation DSP offered when he was called out on this behavior? Why do you make everything about yourself? Because that's what you do when you're a streamer, you idiot. You relate things to your own life and personal experience. It's not making it about yourself, it's adding your own personal take from your own experience. You dumb shit. The difference here is that it is generally considered rude to talk about yourself when you're not asked to. It is never kind to take an issue a person brings forward and respond with how this is similar to yourself and never addressing the concern of your conversational partner. All you end up doing is showing that you are inconsiderate. Number 7. It is no secret that narcissists seek out their narcissistic supply. Whether that is money, fame or attention is a question of personal preference. Should they not get the supply they seek, they will make sure to remind you to provide what they are owed. Their validation seeking consists of a lot of sort of gloomily sharing what they believe their unseen gifts and skills and contributions are. And in fact, they are often the toxic person who sits around and says that they know better than any of the experts on any number of issues or will constantly criticize people who attempt something, who try something, take a chance, or who are aspiring to do something with their lives. This becomes evident in two ways. DSP ties meaning in his life to people on the internet telling him he's a good person. Not a very smart thing to do since the opinion of the public court is a fickle thing. Years, I still feel like I have value in what I'm doing because I have a dedicated group base who come back every day to support. That people loved what I did so much that I could make a living doing it. And in fact, I was making more money on YouTube doing this silly thing than I ever made having any serious job in my entire life. And I felt like for the first time, maybe my life had some meaning because people were telling me that what I did was entertaining them, was making them feel good. It was a good thing that I was doing. Not feeling sure of yourself and where you belong in the world. I felt like that most of my life. I seriously, not even no lie, I felt like that most of my life until I started doing YouTube. And then I kind of felt a little bit better about myself. So just know that if you feel like that, it's perfectly normal. It really is. It's perfectly 100% normal. 
And don't let anyone tell you otherwise either. Don't, oh, if you feel like uncertain or lost, it's because you're a loser. Because you need to discipline yourself or get a life. Remember, people who tell you that are just fucking toxic ass people. This is coming from someone who had authority figures tell me shit like that. It's fucked up. He also demands attention from Chad when he doesn't feel that they include him in the conversation. This leads to him scolding his viewers for not talking to him. If people don't talk about what's going on on the game or on stream constantly that I get angry, that's not the case at all. In fact, nine times out of ten, I just let it go. There's very few exceptions where maybe I'll be in the middle of something critical in a game or something happens that's big or I need help. And I look down at stream chat and literally no one's paying attention to the game. That will irk me because, you know, I understand you guys are here to hang out and chill. I get that. But you have to also understand that I'm, you know, doing something here on stream for a reason. You know, I would think or hope that most people who turn out for my streams are here to be entertained and not as just a chat hangout. You know what I mean? Like there's many other places you could just go and chat hangout. Now I'm not saying that you can't do that, but it's a little disheartening. When here I am, you know, in the middle of a gameplay trying to entertain you or trying to be trying to get somewhere in a game or, or anything, you know. And I look down and no one's paying attention to me, okay? People in the stream chat are so distracted. They're talking about something completely unrelated to what I'm doing. I'm like, it's supposed to be an interactive stream. People in the stream chat have to completely derail the chat to talk about another streamer. And not to say that that's, you can't do that, but I'm doing a special marathon event and they're talking about other shit. I'm like, here I am working my ass off trying to beat these incredibly hard, you know, boss runs with characters I'm not even used to. Oh, let's talk about another streamer. Okay. <laughs> Great. By the way, if anyone wants to talk about stuff, feel free. You know? I'm more than happy to talk about stuff as I play this game, guys. But people are just kind of not really discussing anything towards me, so... I feel kind of disjointed from the chat right now. As a side note, it seems that narcissists seek out people who maintain their high positive self-image while intentionally avoiding and putting down people who give them a harsh dose of realism. Seeking admiration is like a drug for narcissists, notes Dr. Mitcha Buck. In the long run, it becomes difficult because others won't applaud them, so they always have to search for new acquaintances from whom they get the next fix. This explains why DSP's chat is commonly associated to a revolving door. Number 8 Narcissists are no strangers to mental defense mechanisms. Their focus on winning every argument or just to prove themselves superior in conversation is dependent on a multitude of argumentative deadlocks, immature coping strategies and falsehoods. And this reason is because they need to win. They are simply driven to do it because they're trying to protect a fragile sense of self. That's what narcissism does. So for them, it's something they have to do. It doesn't necessarily feel good for them, although it could, as I mentioned with the sadistic component, but it doesn't necessarily have to, but rather it can be something they do to prevent a greater pain. So they endure some suffering to avoid suffering even more. So in essence, they need to fight. They need to put people down. They need to be controlling or else they have to suffer the consequences of realizing they're not really special that they're not better than anyone else, that they don't deserve to be treated like they're superior. And for the narcissist, this is simply unacceptable. That's just bringing on too much pain. There is really something quite powerful about somebody trying to meet a need. And I think it's important not to underestimate that. Research tells us that narcissists are actually fairly persistent at attempting to achieve goals. And they continue to have positive feelings even after they fail at something. So if you take this together with the idea that manipulation is a need for them, this means that they'll do whatever it takes to meet that need. There's deflection. You see, keep in mind, they, they live with an, a sense of alternate reality. They have a very fragile ego, and so they, they want to interpret and arrange truth in front of them in such a way that keeps that fragile ego propped up. So when you come along and say, well, I don't agree, or there's something I think you need to consider, it's like, no, I can't do that. And so one of the primary things that narcissists do in the midst of differences with you is they go into a deflection mode. They'll try, they'll do anything except 
focus on the topic at hand because what that does is it allows them to have an upper hand and uh, they also want to make sure that they keep you confused or they let you know that you're way off base, anything at all to keep them from having to answer your questions or to receive input that they don't particularly want to receive. So all I'm doing is I'm putting out a gameplay stream, right? It's a fun gameplay stream. It's meant to be a fun interactive thing where we just hang out and have a good time playing a video game. People come into that stream and insult me and make up slanderous, disgusting things, defamatory statements, real nasty shit, and they throw it all at me. Oh, shame on you for letting that get to you. What? What about the people who did it? How about we actually go to the root of the problem? The mercilessly unconscious, conscionable shitheads who have, they have no morality, no feelings of right and wrong inside of them. They think that, that insulting people and doing nasty shit is like, okay. So that's not the case anymore. You know, I got thousands of people watching me on YouTube that I basically don't make any money on anymore. It sucks. Um, it's not my fault. It's YouTube's fault. There's nothing much else that we can do. Um, you know, there, there's a sick motherfucker on the internet called Tevin who likes to illegally restream my fucking streams and has an army of fucking trolls who are the only reason why he has any notoriety is because he copies my shit and he eggs his trolls on to do negative shit like this, to come to my stream and to basically make fun of my girlfriend and do nasty shit. It's his fault that this kind of stuff happens. And anyone who supports that kind of fucking content is a mentally ill asshole who has no fucking conscience or morals. Then there's denial. Denial. So this is when somebody simply doesn't accept what's true. I don't really feel that there's anything that I definitively did that caused the trolling that's happened to me. I don't believe that. I don't think there's anything that I ever said or did that actually caused the hate against me. I think it was that viral movement of popularity on YouTube. It became the popular thing to hate Phil, and that's what it always is. Yes, I'm just gonna read them again. Are you guys ready? Threw his fiance under the bus and turned her private medical issue into a drama stream. Didn't happen. Demanded she never go to a hospital again and said that they give her a pill and leave her where they found her. Didn't happen. Um, lied about money issues for a year, not stop begging for cash while flying a girl out uh, to see him, didn't happen. Used tax donations to, to move the woman in with him, didn't happen. Used tax donations to marry the woman, didn't happen. Double binds are something DSP likes to do as well. A double bind is a very specific kind of no-win manipulation in which targets are presented with conflicting messages, each of which negates the other. In effect, they're told, do X and don't do X. When targets are playful, they might be criticized for never taking anything seriously. Then, when they're serious, they're told to stop being a drag and lighten up. The double message is, be serious and don't be serious. Whatever the target chooses, the abuser responds with the other. Targets of narcissists can tie themselves in knots, trying to work out what the narcissist wants. But all the narcissist actually wants is to make the target fail. But it is of the power of my own viewers to decide how they spend their money, where they contribute, what they crowdfund, what they help, what they don't help. That's their choice, actively. You're falling for the trap, is all I can say. You go watch those big guys who get paid the big bucks to play those games early, you fell for the trap. You, from, you basically fell into the, the black hole of early game promotion and the like. <laughs> And basically, it's going to hurt the industry, you know, more than help it. Um, you make the wrong people rich. Is that who you want? Is that all you really want? Do you really want Twitch to become a website where there's 10 people who play everything early and get access to everything, and they're the only ones who can make a living doing this? And everyone else who you love, the genuine gamers, the people who actually care about the industry, the people who actually care about you, all right, and how you spend your money, those people, do you want them to go away because they don't get opportunities anymore? Because that's pretty much what's going to happen if it you know, keeps going down this, uh, this road. Just being honest here. The double bind here is support whoever you want, but don't support the wrong people. I'm an independent guy. I want to be able to say what I want to say. If I want to criticize certain content creators, criticize certain game companies, I want to be able to do it and not worry about, oh no, now I lose a sponsorship opportunity. Oh no, now I lose this and that. It's bullshit. The whole game is bullshit, and it, I hate people like that, who everything they say and do is carefully calculated so they can make more money. Uh, I refuse to do that. Because now, I've lost out on so many opportunities that I should have rightfully have, because I, what you're saying happened didn't happen. And that's harmful to me, to my business, to my livelihood, to, to my wife, to everyone, because you fucked around and lied about me. The double bind here is, I refuse to do sponsorships, but I should have them anyway. 
I really couldn't shave for my job. I'm shaving actually immediately following this stream. I'm shaving and showering because tomorrow's my day off with cat. So since I'm actually going to be in front of real people, uh, that's when I shave. So there you go. You know, I, I'm streaming on the internet on a tiny webcam. Not a big deal. Actually going out, I don't want to look like a bum when I'm with my wife. So there you go. The double blind here is, I want to look presentable for the public, but not for a public stream. DSP enjoys mocking people. Another deflecting tactic that narcissists can use is they'll go into the mocking and ridiculing style of communication. They, they want to neutralize you and anything that you have to say with sarcasm and caustic comments. They, they may give you the eye roll or speak in a sneering or a haughty kind of way. Or they may something, say something, as you talk with them about the problems, they may say something like, um, so you're telling me that I'm the most impossible person you've ever met and you've ever talked to. Boo hoo, it must really suck to be you. Or they may some, say something in a mocking kind of way like, I'm so scared that you're gonna whine and complain about me again. And so they, they just kind of give you that kind of uh, haughty and condescending approach. And before you know it, you talk about their haughty, condescending approach, and then they defend that, and then again, we're off the topic. And people are so butthurt about me. They are so angry and butthurt. People who don't like me right now are probably typing away at the computers. I can't believe it. He reached another desk girl. How can he do that? Listen to how he answers his question. And my butt hurts so bad. This question from Electric Sheep Dreams is so presumptuous. Like, how dare you presume to play the game that I love and I have an approved list of criteria by which you must check off each checkbox in order in a certain period of time. And if you don't, ooh, you are just a plebeian. You didn't play that game with the Minecraft approved plan of playing it. How could you? It's ridiculous. It's so pretentious. Okay, so people now are, are gonna argue with me about semantics because they're being jerks in the street. It's not a disease, it's a disorder. All right, it's a disorder. It's not what I'm talking about. We're not here to argue semantics and shit, all right? We're here to talk real turkey about what this what this is, this disorder. I'll call it a disorder. Oh, for the little Nancys who might get offended that I said disease instead of disorder. Oh my God, okay. Passive aggression is often expressed through procrastination. Do I need to say more about the guy who is constantly late to his own streams? Now, another pattern that is commonly observed in covert narcissists is their passive aggressiveness. Now, while their grandiose and malignant narcissistic buddies are more likely to kind of just tell you off to your face, just tell you you're stupid to your face, or tell you that, they, that you don't know anything, the covert narcissists are more likely to do this in a sullen backdoor way. They'll say things like, oh, must be nice to have a family that just always bails you out. Must be nice to get overpaid for your job. Must be nice that you have such a big house. You, you get the idea, on and on and on. Passive aggressive people will often cast themselves in sort of a victim or martyr role that can result in uncomfortable feelings by you rather than almost that fear you'd get if someone was right up in your face. And most often, like I said, that feeling is guilt by the person who's hearing it. Now the phrase must be nice is often the tagline for passive aggression. It must be nice that you have so much money. It must be nice that you went on vacation to Hawaii. You know, it must be nice to be a scumbag who just does nothing but talk shit about people and cause drama on YouTube and then make, you know, six figures a year. That's really hard work. <laughs> he says he has unlimited money. Wow. It must be nice to live a life of unlimited money, dude. Holy crap. I have so many items now, dude. Oh yeah, I guess first I had the day off, I got an afternoon nap in. That must be nice. Couldn't tell you the last time I, I was able to get an afternoon nap. His passive aggression also comes out in other audible ways. Oh my god. <laughs> 
narcissists love to project their own inadequate feelings onto others. Projection is the most classical defense of the narcissist. And this is something that's been written about by the, in the granddaddies of the field, Freud and Kernberg and all of them. Now it makes sense because projection is deep and primitive, just like the insecurity and the ego vulnerability of the narcissist. Projection happens when a person projects an unacceptable thought or behavior or feeling or an uncomfortable conflict onto someone else. Now, what you've got to keep in mind, and this is the tricky bit, this is not a conscious process. Now, projection is a key mechanism with NPD as it relates to insight, in my opinion. And it's also important because the research literature shows us that projection out of all the defense mechanisms is the most strongly associated with NPD. And when I deal with people who have narcissism, when their narcissism is challenged, they will frequently go to things like projection of the person who is challenging their narcissism. Right? So like if I tell you, hey, I think maybe you have this kind of ego, the simplest way for your that kind of ego to hide is to debunk or de diffuse or challenge or pull the legs out of what I'm, I'm trying to say. You know, maybe if there were high level explosives in every single car, people would drive more safely. Then again, the truth of the matter is people are so fucking stupid, they probably wouldn't. They would probably drive the same and just all blow up and die, so. Um, ATS-318 Cherry says you're obviously giving people a heads up so they won't end up being disappointed when the streak ends. I don't get it because it's supporting you at the end of the day, so why are people pissed when the streak keeps going or if you bring it up? Because they're jealous. Because these people hate me for irrational reasons. There's no rational justification for them to go to the level of obsession and hatred towards me that they have. And then when they see me successful, they get so jealous that someone they don't like and they feel makes terrible content is being is getting success that's what it is why in, on on this planet do we have to always play the blame game i this is actually something unrelated but why do we have to do this when something goes wrong there's always got to be a finger to point and someone who has to be responsible afterward maybe things are just fucked up sometimes you ever think of that maybe things though this isn't a land of lollipops and fucking rainbows you know what i mean and this is a serious world where things get messed up and sometimes you just have to deal with the repercussions and say how do we get past the blame game and say can we just fucking get past that and fix the find a way to make make the problem fixed? Rationalization is the attempted pseudo explanation of irrational behavior to avoid the true explanation. Other defense mechanisms would include intellectualization and rationalization, which are somewhat similar. It's not healthy to obsess about someone. All right, let alone a content creator like me who's not even big anymore. When you look at myself and you compare me to other streamers that are considered controversial streamers and stuff, I think I'm pretty tame. You look at people like Wings of Redemption or LTG or, or one of these other people who people constantly bring up on my streams with their own negative memes and shit, and they're like, man, these guys, you know, the stuff that they get into and the stuff that they do and get in trouble for is way beyond anything that happens on, on your content, you know? So it's weird that you get the kind of hate that you do feel when these people are like, you know, levels above, levels beyond the stuff that would happen on any of your streams. But the point I'm making here is I am small potatoes and I barely ever get involved with controversy. Um, Phil, Philly Buckeye ESP, cheers. says, how can people still justify hating on you so much considering all the terrible stuff these other people are doing? It just makes the treatment you get pretty BS. I mean, I've only been saying that since the beginning. All right. I'm proud of that. Even if you say my content is cringeworthy and terrible, at least I can say, you know what? Criticize me as much as you want, but look at these other people who have done these horrible things over the years, and now it's all blowing up in their face. Splitting is the mental defense mechanism, commonly known as black and white thinking, or all or nothing thinking. Splitting, which has a few different forms, but it's the tendency to see things as black or white, zero or one, and splitting can relate to oneself, so this would be an individual with NPD seeing themselves as always good, and it can relate to other individuals. And oftentimes this would be an individual with NPD seeing others as always good or always bad. A lot of times we believe that individuals with this disorder have difficulty relating to others as an equal. 
So they tend to put somebody in a category either above them or below them. And of course, most of the time we think it's below them. This is where we get the grandiosity and the superciliousness. Dude, now go look at any random YouTube video. There's so much disgusting th stuff in the comments and everything. It's just a nasty place to be. Cody Carl's Charity said, how do you know YouTube comments are like if you don't have time to watch YouTube videos? Because all you have to do is look at any video randomly for one second. It doesn't have to be like you're watching a million videos. Just watch the comments of any random video and you'll see. You'll see the, the ridiculous and nasty. And what the fuck is this? <laughs> Let them circle jerk each other and do whatever they want. They're just a bunch of negative idiots. They're going to keep doing it no matter what. I don't care what they make anymore. There's no point in even focusing on it. I'm here on Twitch having fun with you guys every day. That's what's important. Not what the negative idiots are doing outside of the range of what we do together. So, screw them. I mean, like, Taurus, like, seriously, like, you're a positive person in this chat. So I would feel really bad, like, banning you because you've been, like, a really positive influence. And I would hope that you're not doing neg negative shit on the back end to the other chatters. Like, some of these weirdos have been doing and messaging other people and everything, which is screwed up in my opinion. You know, one thing you're going to troll me. Now you're going to troll other people who are here too. Like, come on, man. But it's weird that I find out that you're also in this other stuff. And I'm like, uh, huh. I play both sides of the fence. You can't both like me and hate me. It doesn't work that way. That's not how life works. You can't do both. Because you can't play both sides, dude. You just can't. It's not a way to go through life. All right. And finally, upward social comparisons are those social comparisons where you compare yourself to people who are more successful than you. Covert narcissists are repeated offenders of this kind of behavior. With a covert narcissist, their personality doesn't have the ingredients there. They don't have the extroversion. They're highly neurotic. They're painfully shy. They've got the hidden grandiosity. So they're inferior, and, and so therefore they make what's called upward social comparisons. So they're painfully aware of anyone that's higher in the dominance hierarchy than them. And this triggers painful feelings of envy for this individual and feelings of resentment. PewDiePie, Markiplier, Jacksepticeye, do you see a pattern? You see, they all look the same. They all dress the same. They all dye their hair. They all scream at cameras. You see what I mean? Their names sound the fucking same. See what I mean? It's, they're all the same. It's all the same gimmick done ad nauseum, but the same dumb fucking kids watched them over and over and made them millionaires. It says, have you ever made up a wrestling persona? Jim Sterling is so much fun with it. Would you even think of a hobby like that? No, because I'm an adult. I'm not an idiot. The era of PewDiePie being pertinent to anything is pretty much dead. No one talks about the guy anymore. Um, this is not surprising in the least. Um, so... I really could give a shit if he's the biggest YouTuber or not. I don't think anyone cares. If anything, most people have accepted the fact that the biggest YouTube channels are pretty much the least quality. Number 9. Next to subconsciously making themselves feel better, narcissists also enjoy to manipulate you emotionally. This occurs in different ways. They're natural manipulators. It's Remember, when you don't have normal access to empathy or you choose not to use it, when you are entitled but you're not skilled enough and not secure enough to make a direct ask, you get your needs met through manipulation. Okay, that's why they manipulate. They mm -hmm. do not have the skill set to say, this is what I want, this is what I need. You need to value yourself to say, this is what I need or want. Character assassination is the practice to deliberately harm an individual's credibility or reputation. Instead of addressing the criticism at hand, negative character traits are assigned to the critic. Another deflection, and this is big, uh, that narcissists do when you uh, try to talk with them about differences, notice they'll get away from the topic and they'll use character assassination against you. They'll overtly attempt to make you look foolish. This is a, a variation of the old um, uh, tactic of shooting the messenger. For example, you talk with them about something that's important, you uh, make a confrontation, they'll look at you with, with this contempt and say, everyone knows that the stuff that you say is just made up. I mean, uh, why would anyone listen to you? Or you're always finding fault. And what they do is they'll, they'll throw these kind of character kinds of qualities at you of a very unflattering nature 
hoping that you're going to take that bait and go off and, and discuss why your character is good. And before you know it, we're not talking about the topic at hand, which is what they want. Sam Bridges, now you're just being absolutely ludicrous to the point where I don't even know if I want to keep talking to you. He goes, well, you're saying that people can be gullible for, for believing detractors, but there's the argument your chat is gullible, gullible for believing you. Yes, when someone watches a person who's a content creator and they like that person, they tend to trust them. You could say that's gullible or you could say that's giving them the benefit of the doubt. Or you could say that's learning to trust them from a, a series of life experiences where they know that person is being truthful. Like, you have no point, Sam Bridges. You're trying to make me look bad. You're failing miserably. So I, my suggestion to you would be give up before you get your, your, your ass kicked out of the chat for good. Because you're being a complete asshole tonight. You're so stupid. God. Hey, fuck you. Jesus, you're stupid. <clears throat> I actually fucking killed him. Oh, look, and that was a detractor, too. That was actually an idiot detractor, and he got completely owned by a fucking shitty handgun. What a dumb fuck. <laughs> look at this dumb fuck. Yeah, look what he had. He had a fucking rampart. What a horrible fucking piece of shit player. Wow. Congratulations. You actually proved my point about how dumb you fucks are. <laughs> that was pathetic, bro. And it's funny, because, again, there's so many people who... All they do is bring down others, yet they wouldn't exist if those others weren't successful in the fucking first place. You know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> I have a thousand people on my stream making fun of someone. Yeah, but if that person wasn't successful, you wouldn't exist. You're a professional ass, basically. All you do is talk shit about people. How is that any fucking value? And why do you think you have a, so many immature fucking people on your stream constantly? And you could never hold an intelligent fucking conversation if you wanted to, because the collective IQ in there is probably about negative 77. You know, it's like a vacuum of fucking stupidity. <laughs> Controlling behavior is something that can appear often with narcissists. As they operate from a position of insecurity, control is a trait which gives them a sense of relief while others suffer under their hard restrictions and rules. And basically, they want control. They want superiority. They want everything to go according to their game plan, according to their preferences, their cravings, their desires. They're very self-absorbed kind of individuals and it's all about oneself. And they wanna make sure that you understand that and so that you can perpetuate and keep that game of theirs going. That's what they want. And you know that there are many ways that they go about doing it. They can argue with you, and, and in, in their arguing, it's their way of saying, you have to listen to me. You have to know that what I'm saying is the ultimate. I'm the ultimate. Sometimes they may ignore you. It's like, okay, if you don't pay attention to me, I'll just make you suffer. Or sometimes they can just invalidate you as you're trying to talk and explain that there are some thoughts and ideas that you have that might need to be attended to. It's like, no, nah, you don't even know what you're talking about. So they invalidate. What the hell, man? Dude, guys, I'm trying to play a game and have fun. I go back and look at the stream chat. You guys are talking about other fucking female streamers and shit. Stop. Seriously, stop. If you want to go talk about other fucking people, go, go to their streams, man. I'm, I'm thinking, oh, I wonder what people have to say about the gameplay of this epic match where I held out the whole time. You know, the guy had three lives down to one. Oh, wow, what's everyone have to say? Oh, we're talking about a female streamer. Grow up, man. What the fuck? Come on, guys. You know better than that. You're here to fucking hang out with me, have fun, not to be talking about other shit. Stop it, man. Opposable, yeah. Basically, everyone in the chat is basically being trolling and shit, and no one's talking to me, and no one's addressing the game. So I'm just gonna fucking focus on the game. I'm not gonna let my stream be derailed by people being stupid, because all they're gonna do is complain the game is boring instead of talking to me, which is exactly what I said on the fucking pre-stream. I said... If you think the game's boring, talk to me. We'll have fun today. Everyone ignores me, so fuck off then. I'll just play the game. Seriously, that's the attitude I'm going to have because I'm not going to let the same 10 people who come here every day sit and whine that the game's boring. I'm just going to enjoy the game for myself then. Now I can control everything. I control the total. I control the messages that I read on the stream. I like retaining control. I'm maintaining a business here. I need to be sure that I control what I say and do and what shows up on my stream. Okay? Lying and gaslighting are equally common among narcissists. The latter refers to the strategy of questioning the perception, memory, or judgment of another person. This results in the gaslighted person doubting their own reality and effectively disarming any of the victim's arguments through deliberate misinformation, denial, and contradiction.
So I'm going to run you through some classical statements, the kinds of words people use when they're gaslighting you. So here are some of the classics. Stop being so sensitive. Stop being such, so, oh, I'm so sensitive. Phil said something to a single viewer. Ah, relax. Calm down. It's not the end of the fucking world. Holy shit. I swear to God, people, when I started this on YouTube and shit, I could said such ridiculous things on purpose and no one cared. Now it's 2017. God forbid someone blatantly is insulting me and saying shit in the stream chat because they don't understand the fucking game. I say something back. Oh my God, we're so offended. Grow up. Grow fucking pair. Seriously, grow a pair of fucking balls before you go on someone's stream because you will be bought her about any little thing that happens. Everyone's so fucking sensitive in this world today. And I'm so tired of pussyfooting around shit. That never happened. Versus when you rebroadcast my stream, those are viewers that should have been on my stream, that may have contributed to my stream, now they're contributing to someone else, that's theft. Then Tevin gives you all the money he stole from you back. He didn't steal any money from me, I never said that. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. I never said he stole any money, he didn't steal. The bottom line is the people that contribute to him would never contribute to me anyway. I think you may be mentally ill, you need help. I do mean that. They're mentally challenged. They have issues. They have problems in their heads. You want to know how you know that? Because guess what? Normal people who are well-adjusted don't spend their fucking time stalking a person who streams video games on the internet and or stalking their followers. Just think about how, how insane that is. I'm so mentally fucked in my head. I think it's a good use of my time to harass people who send bits to someone on a live stream. That's just fucked in the head, dude. That's not normal mental behavior. Any doctor will tell you that. It's definite mental illness. Why? Because they're mentally unstable. They're fucked in the head. They need help. Simply put, gaslighting is the doubting of another person's reality, deliberate or not. It can be done by that long variety of phrases that I read to you above. By saying something, then denying it by promising something and then denying the promise. Over time, the gaslighted person feels confused and full of self-doubt. Guilt trips are an effective tool as well. Abusing the victim's sense of guilt, covert narcissists manage to garner sympathy, attention, and narcissistic supply through this form of passive aggression. Their manipulation, while it's very much present, is not as direct as we see in grandiose and in malignant narcissism. They tend to manipulate through their victimhood, their passive aggressive words, barbs and actions, and by pulling on your sense of guilt. The bottom line is I can't even do it anymore. You know, I was in a position in 2015 where I could, I had, was making enough money and doing stuff, I could do a charity event. I had to call it off because of all the trolling that happened to me, and ever since then I've had a decline in income and shit because of all the trolling actions against me. So, in, in essence, the trolls who criticize me the most are the ones who caused me to have the bad situation I'm in, and now I can't ever do a charity event because of it. So there you go. Ow. Alright, so... Any support you guys can lend, uh, especially moral support right now, is fucking needed. People could just be nice to me for a change. Not to say that you, most people are, you know, people who watch my videos and streams, my god, you guys have been awesome, but... And the reason that I read that to you guys is because I want... I just want you guys to understand that that means the world to me when I get a message like that. Like, it's been tough. You know, my life has been tough over the last decade. It has. And when I read a message like that, I'm sorry that I'm tearing up like a baby. But when I read a message like that, it makes me feel like it was worth it, you know? Like, all the shit that happened to me, and all the stress and the, the mental shit that I go through on a daily basis, sometimes, um, that it's worth it because there's people out there who got something out of all of this, you know? It wasn't just some dickhead in front of a camera, uh, you know, doing stupid videos, that it actually meant something to people. And that means the world to me, that there's people out there that, you know, for a decade, Invalidation of people and or their arguments is another strategy covert narcissists use to win their arguments. Let's suppose that you have a difference or uh, a conflict that you need to discuss with the narcissist. One of the first things they'll do is they'll deflect by going into the invalidation mode. 
They want to make sure that you understand that you're wrong and you're misinformed. For example, they may uh, use deflecting statements like, how can you possibly think that way? Or uh, you so don't know what you're talking about. Or you have no right to say that. Or this is ridiculous, which means you're ridiculous. So they invalidate who you are, what you say, what you feel. Lightning God, you have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> Lightning God is absolutely hilarious. Lightning God has no idea what the hell he's talking about at all. And he keeps telling me to get another job. Corey, you have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not even going to go into He just has no idea what he's talking about. Okay. Pisa May is retiring. That's great. What did he do when he was with Nintendo anyway? Nothing, so who cares? The biggest one of them all, the good old lie. Rather, I would say that narcissists tell these type of lies because the truth is offensive to them. The narcissist fully believes that they deserve to be successful, wealthy, skilled, the best at everything, rewarded in every way. The reason they haven't achieved everything that they want, everything that they desire, is because people fail to recognize how great the narcissist is. And that's really the foundational injustice for the narcissist. In the mind of the narcissist, the rest of the world simply isn't smart enough, good enough, attentive enough to understand the greatness of the narcissist and the kind of incredible impact the narcissist can have on society. Therefore, lying just isn't something that's done on a whim, done seemingly with no purpose. Lying actually sets the record straight. It's done to undo the injustice of the truth. The truth, what actually happened, the narcissist's actual level of accomplishments, wealth, whatever it is, is offensive and unjust. From the narcissist's point of view, lying is not only morally acceptable, it's morally mandated. They have to lie to set things right. To tell the truth to people would be to injure them, to expose them to this horrible crime committed against the narcissist, this idea that the narcissist did not receive the admiration that they deserve. This crime is so terrible that people just couldn't really understand it. So the narcissist takes the liberty of telling a lie that should have been the truth. And in essence, for the other people that heard the narcissist lie, their perception is the reality. In the minds of those people, the narcissist is great. The offensive truth has been erased and replaced with a just narrative. And that's really the point of these types of lies, to create a narrative that is consistent with the narcissist's self-image and to destroy any narrative that isn't. They continue to lie even when they've been caught in the deception. This is something we see with narcissism and sometimes with psychopathy. It's one thing to lie to somebody, get caught, and then acknowledge the deception. Narcissists can't do this. They have to pretend that the lie is actually the truth. So for them, living the lie and even becoming the lie is more desirable than telling the truth. DSP proclaims that he invented the term playthrough when he never did. Um, I didn't know anything about Let's Plays or anything like that when I was making content for YouTube. So I just, I created the term playthrough. I did it. The word saw use before he first used it in his videos, which is before December 2008, and even generated impressions on Google Trends before he even created his channel. To this day, DSP proclaims that he never made any money doing videos on YouTube between the years of 2008 and 2010. Different kind of phases of content creation that I've done, and I would say like 2008 through 2011 was the formative years, like the early years of like two and a half, three years there where I was just doing stuff. I didn't make a dime doing it, made no money whatsoever. People pointed out that he had his PayPal linked in his YouTube channel description. He then shifted the goalposts to he didn't advertise this link and received no donations through it. Quote, That link was there since the original Darkseid Phil channel in 2008, but I never ever advertised it or talked about it. And nobody donated anything via that method either. They just physically sent me stuff, games, etc. You are a moron. End quote. Unsurprisingly, this is another lie. But anyway, thank you.
thank you so much. I also want to say thank you very much to anyone who's ever donated. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you can go to paypal.com and send a payment to darksidephil at hotmail.com. I accept any amount, whatever you can, you know, you feel like you want to give me. It is a donation. It's not a direct payment or anything like that. So please understand, don't ask me for something specifically because you're going to pay me. That's not how it works. It has to be, you know, your willingness to just give me something to help me out. By the way, it has helped me out a lot. As you see, in the past year, not only have I moved, but I've gotten better equipment. I've gotten games that I hadn't planned on getting. I ended up getting because I had some donations that helped me out. And I plan to only get bigger and better as we move on. Hopefully I'll get better equipment in the future. I'm actually planning eventually to go to some gaming conventions. Okay. I want to say thank you to Pascal LaRue, who actually gave his second donation of all time today to me. And also to John Snell, who made a significantly large donation, the largest donation I've received so far. So I just want to let you know I do appreciate that, and that will be going towards, you know, the cost of future games. Uh, especially now that I am moving very soon. DSP proclaims that he doesn't advertise after his pre-streams, when on multiple occasions he did the exact opposite. And if you're someone who actually cares about games like me, you know, it's one thing if you're a streamer and all you do is you're trying to fundraise constantly. That's not me. You guys know... I do this fundraising segment, you know, every stream, it's the plugs, I do it early on, every stream, and then as soon as I get the gameplay, that's it, you don't hear about it anymore, alright, a lot of streamers, it's just constantly hammering you with that stuff, alright, and I'm not all about that, alright, I said this on pre-stream, I'll say it w once more time quickly, uh, right now YouTube ad revenue is in the toilet, my views are actually way up, but... My revenue is down. I'm making half as much money on YouTube right now as I was in the months of May and June. And it's YouTube's fault for not being able to get ad space and advertisements in the summer. So your support on stream is very much appreciated because without it, uh, I'm going to have a few really rough months here. So far, things have been really great this week. You guys were very supportive. So, you know, you like my stuff, please keep it up. And thank you for any support you could lend right now today. The best way you could support me is to tip me. Right now, I received two tips today so far. How do you tip? Well, if you look below the stream, there's a button that says Tips Jar. Click on that. Hey, yeah, how's it going, man? Good to see you. Just a quick reminder, because a lot of people seem to be joining the stream, you know, in the in the last game. Uh, please, if you want to help me out the most tonight, please tip me. I really need the, the help with tips right now. Uh, things are not good with me financially. They're really fucking bad for the next 10 days till I get paid by Twitch. And any uh, tips that you guys contribute in the next 10 days are going straight to fucking bills so that I don't go crazy over drafting my account or getting bills unpaid, which would not be good. So please, please, please. And to end on an ironic footnote. Last time you were caught in a lie that made you feel very embarrassed. The last time I was caught in a lie and it made me feel very embarrassed. Uh, huh. Man, that's a tough Precept question. That's actually imminent. Get to safety. I don't know. Last but certainly not least is the victimhood covert narcissists entrench themselves in. The chronic victimhood and the exhaustion of listening to their resentment and frustration and anger all of the time can leave you feeling very depleted. If you do keep falling for their tales of woe and their stance as a victim, you can wear yourself out and you can wear yourself out because you're constantly trying to reassure them and rescue them and tell them it's all going to be okay. And this will end up wasting for you a lot of time, a lot of money, and a lot of emo emotional en energy and you will have nothing to show for it because they're not going to change. Why do you think people have stabbed you in the back? Because I'm an easy target. Because I'm an easy target with really no way to retaliate being that I'm a public persona and so many people have treated me so shittily in my life and they know that and they know that basically I have no way to retaliate against anything so why not, right? If you can get personal gain by stepping on someone's back and crushing them, why not? And that's what it is. People have done that my whole life. Seriously, I mean that. Like, so many friendships and relationships where people have just kind of messed with me and fucked with me and used me uh, and, and fucked me over to get their own way. You know, it sucks. But that's, it's literally almost everyone, too. <clears throat> you know, during that conversation, I talked about my own personal experiences and battles with it because people asked me. They said, Phil, you know, you're one of the people who basically gets attacked the most on the internet. Understand? Why me? Why is this motherfucker? Why do these people latch on to me? 
Why, why do people latch on to me? I'm just, you know... I just don't get it. In fact, don't take my word for it. Take DSPs. Tom Bone took me a dollar. Says, do you ever get tired of being the victim? Yeah, every day. I don't ever want to be a victim. I never wanted to be, but I, sadly I am, you know? Um, I want to just be a, a positive content creator. I'm, I am absolutely 100% tired of being mistreated, tired of being attacked, tired of being slandered and defamed on a daily fucking basis by people. But they keep doing it. I didn't put myself into the situation. Others did. You know, I don't want to be like this. I never, by the way, never really cared or talked about shit like this until it started really negatively affecting my life years ago, right? So, there you have it. Number 10. Envy is the predominant emotion covert narcissists feel. They harbor contempt to minimize another person's success in order to secure perceived superiority. And what envy entails is the desire for the envious individual toward the person who possesses what they want, toward that person losing that possession, toward them being stripped of it. So it's a very uh, primitive and powerful and hostile emotion. So they're painfully aware of anyone that's higher in the dominance hierarchy than them. And this triggers painful feelings of envy for this individual and feelings of resentment. So this is a person that is much more vulnerable to feelings of envy and those feelings festering into hatred and contempt. I don't even need to do any convincing here. DSP admitted to his own jealousy on multiple occasions. I have one final thing that I want to say, and this I mean from the bottom of my heart, all right? And I'll be honest with you guys, to some extent, when I see a big streamer who's way more successful than me, or I see a giant YouTuber who literally just did something really fucking stupid and got virally popular because of something stupid that they did, and now they're basically set for life because they're millionaires. When I see that, yes, it gets to me. It does. And I think it gets to all of us in some, in some extent. We see someone like that, and you're like, man, you know what? Why not me? And you see that, and you're always going to have that feeling, that nagging feeling in the back of your head that, man, that should have been me, and that little bit of jealousy. And I didn't publicly admit that to you guys right now. I feel it. I do feel it. All right? I absolutely 100% feel it. And I get angry sometimes when I see those tweets. This person who's filthy rich and or so successful. Oh, life is great, and everyone should be positive. And here, I'm going to share positivity with you. Of course you could share positivity, because you're filthy rich, right? He said, when was the last time you felt a human emotion of envy? Um, you know, I feel it from time to time. I'll be honest, I'm human, right? Everyone has it. But there's people who literally do less work than me and are making two times as much money as me on just doing YouTube videos. They don't even live stream. I am. I'm envious of people who get to do what they love on the internet and don't have this insane negativity attached to it. I'm very envious and jealous of that, that they never had that toxic movement happen to them like it's happened to me. I've always said this, and people give me shit. Oh, Phil, you just say that because you're jealous of bigger bigger content creators. You just say that because you wish you had their popularity and their money. I mean, let's be honest. Of course there's a factor of jealousy. Here's people who literally get up in the morning. Like I said, all they do, they get up, they have a team of people who feed them drama news. They pick and choose. They cherry pick the ones they think they can get the most toxicity out of. They milk that shit. They put out a video a day of bullshit that really is no kind of value or content. They hurt people and they make money doing it. That's their life. Number 11. With great envy comes great resentment. Narcissists are not known to forgive and forget. Grievances are a way of life for them. And while they will hold almost no memories for all the good things that you have done for them, their memory is prodigious for remembering everything you have done wrong. It's quite significant how well they can remember all those bad things that they seem to have put in a special vault in their brain. How do they bridge the gap between that idealized grandiose self and the reality of their lives, which is often not very flattering? And the way that they do bridge the gap is by obsessively focusing on what is blocking their greatness being actualized and by becoming very angry and resentful at those factors or people or situations that they feel is blocking their greatness. So this is a person who has an incredibly deep capacity for resentment 
To this day, DSP is resentful that he never received the proper acknowledgement for his fourth place at EVO in 2007. And that was it. So I was the top placing American that year. It was actually three Japanese players above me. And then I was right under there. So I was fourth place. But I was the top placing American in Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo that year. So technically I was the best ranked Super Street Fighter 2 Turbo player that year. But no one wanted to acknowledge it. As soon as immediately after the tournament ended. I shit you not. It was like write this off it doesn't count even though it'll be on paper that he qualified or that he beat this guy and that guy and then on paper he made it to the finals and he's the highest ranked american doesn't count because that was a bad version of super turbo and so it's kind of an unwritten law or word that that year even though i was the highest ranked american player it didn't matter didn't count in the real super street fighter 2 turbo tournament it was john Choi and alex valle who were at the top and everyone else no it's bullshit what it is is they're so fucking egotistical and cocky these west coast super turbo players they can't accept a loss or defeat and they were so angry that they had to play a different version of the game that year that they purposely didn't practice dsp is still upset about his past office job he was laid off from in 2010. crazy time you got a bonus but you might lose your job isn't that kind of like that's just like me. I got a commendation. I actually got a big commendation at my job. A big special, you know, certificate that said you went above and beyond and then two months later they laid me off. Fucking idiots. Finally, DSP is still holding a grudge about how wrongfully his former friends treated him over four years ago. I didn't hold a grudge against him. He's the one who didn't respond to me, cut off contact with me, then made a video saying that I was basically a bad person and that he was really upset about things that I had done over the years. So, the ball would be in his court. We texted all the time, so I don't understand what his gripe was. I really don't. I don't get to this day. I don't understand what his big holdup. I really feel that there was, like, underlying pent-up issues that he doesn't want to talk about. A real person who has responsibility, who has respect, who acts like a true responsible adult, a man, per se, rather than someone who's a coward, who hides, who has pent-up resentment, passive-aggressive behaviors. A real person will upfront tell you when there's a problem. They won't hold it behind closed doors secretly, pretend like it doesn't exist, and then all of a sudden blow it up in your face to make you look bad. It's been over four years, guys. That was the burned bridge. That was them telling me, we really don't want anything to do with you. Even though they stay with their very fake faces in the video, say, oh, we, uh, we would like to still have a, a connection with Phil. The phone lines are open. The phone lines have been open. I've been t texting you for six fucking months and you never responded. So it's not that all of a sudden magically the phone lines are open. It's that you didn't respond to me. They're, it's basically facetious. It's them saying one thing and meaning another. They want to look like the positive guys who never had anything wrong. Okay? They do. They want to look like they were always in the right and they did nothing wrong and I was the villain. Because that lets gives them the way out. If you have a memory that's more than 18 months old, approximately, and when you pull that memory up to mind if you still have an emotional reaction that means you haven't fully articulated the memory you haven't analyzed it causally you haven't you haven't freed yourself from its grasp and you're carrying it like a weight and your brain responds to that like the more more weight you're carrying like that more baggage let's say the more of the stress hormone cortisol your brain produces and cortisol makes you old but if you're 30, 35, or 20, and most of the time you're thinking about your past, it's like, it's like your soul is trapped back there. And you need, to, you need to free it through investigation. And the metaphysical language is appropriate because that is, in a sense, what you're doing. You're trapped in the past. It's like you've got to break free of that so you can use all your resources to move ahead into the future. Number 12. Since the covert narcissist loves to establish their perceived superiority, they reserve the right to act condescending towards others. This shows in behavior where narcissists explain things others already know, minimize efforts of their peers, or tell others to relax. The last symptom criterion is the appearance of being arrogant. Sometimes we think of this as being supercilious. And this is one of the more obvious symptoms in terms of there's observable behavior that we can tie to it. I've seen this manifest in a number of ways too. You could see condescending behavior, somebody talking down to somebody else. We can see the individual with MPD accuse somebody of poor performance or poorly evaluating the performance. 
For example, if they buy something from a salesperson, they may rate that experience very negatively, when in fact the salesperson really didn't do anything out of line that would merit such a rating. I'm sorry that some people complain that it takes like, oh my God, like a minute of work to sign up for a website, which by the way, once you're signed up, you'll never have to sign up again. You'll be able to vote on every poll forever. By the way, if you guys haven't noticed, there's been many viewers choice events in the past six plus months. I think there's been three. So if you're still sitting around complaining that you don't want to register for a site, it's time to grow up and stop acting like a four year old and realize that this will actually benefit you in the long run to be able to vote on so many events that will be viewers choice coming up in the future that you should just grin and bear it and do it. All right, stop whining and just do it. And that way you'll be able to participate in all these events because I'm not doing straw polls. I'm not doing Twitter polls. It's gonna be on the forums from now on. So it just makes no sense that people would subscribe to the channel to hit a subscriber goal for a viewer's choice event to happen, then not vote on the event because they're too fucking lazy to spend one minute to sign up for a site. Grow up. Why is everyone else my favorite of this and my favorite of that? Uh, first of all, it's the most rudimentary question. Really, it's the most rudimentary question. What's your favorite this? What's your favorite, favorite, least liked? Least liked, most liked, least liked, most liked. It's like if you have nothing to talk about, you ask like the most rudimentary question about what's your favorite. I don't play favorites, and I've played so many games in my lifetime. I'm not going to go back over the course of my entire fucking life now and somehow remember the one favorite female character. Like, what a ridiculous thing. <laughs> uh, no W Day Day. I have zero, zero intention to return to Red Dead Online. It was boring as hell when it launched, and from what everyone's explained, it hasn't gotten any better. This is an especially good example of condescending behavior. Don't ever do this while you're talking to someone. What looking at your fingernails while talking to someone signals is that whatever is going on under your fingernails is miles more interesting than what the other person had to tell you. Number 13. Resulting from such a negative outlook on the world in general, the covert narcissist appears to be virtually unhappy most of the time. Now, simply put, covert narcissists are chronic malcontents. They are never satisfied or content with anything. And that dissatisfaction comes out as criticism, complaining, contempt, anger, dismissiveness, frustration, all kinds of negative kinds of mood states and displays. They will complain about everything and that makes life a miserable experience for anyone who has to spend time with them. But narcissists don't provide accurate feedback. They provide feedback in order to widen the crack in the foundation, not to fix the crack. Because by widening the crack, the fissure in that foundation seems smaller by comparison. And that's what the narcissist is really trying to do. They're trying to feel better by making the victim feel worse. Narcissists aren't trying to move up the ladder. They're trying to push you down the ladder. Now on this note of criticism, another associated characteristic is that it seems in some cases, no amount of praise can compensate for criticism. One way this becomes apparent is by observing how DSP never celebrates the success of other people, especially if they are already more successful than him. It should be obvious that he's primarily interested in widening the crack in the foundation instead of fixing it. Here is how he reacts when things went well for Dr. Disrespect. Tim will slice his shears and say, hey Phil, how you doing? What's your opinion on Dr. Disrespect getting a TV show? I don't have any opinion on Dr. Disrespect getting a TV show. I don't care about Dr. Disrespect whatsoever. I don't know why you even ask me about another content creator on my stream that I don't give a fuck about. So thanks for the cheer. Okay. On the other hand, here is how DSP reacts when Dr. Disrespect received punishment for his E3 bathroom incident. This shit is too out of control. Me, I'm gonna sit back, I'm gonna play some games at home, I'm gonna share those experiences with you, and that's the extent of what I do. These motherfuckers, oh, I'm gonna go to E3, I'm gonna film people pissing in the bathroom. No decency, no respect, no common sense, no fucking maturity. It's called, give me money. Give me, give me drama dollars and give me money. And that's all it's about. It's about these scumbags doing fucking irresponsible things. They think the whole world is the world of jackass or something. So for him, it's like, oh, I'm just above any kind of reproach or criticism because I'm popular. I can just do whatever I want. I'm going to go and completely disrespect the law and disrespect the rules of privacy and morality just to get attention today. Since it's not already enough that people meet DSP's donation goal daily, 
people are also required to hit it the way DSP wants. Does this sound like a person who is happy with the support they receive? Considering contributing. If you are considering contributing um, to the stream, I would say if you could contribute sooner rather than later, that would obviously help more because the sooner we hit the goal, number one, I'll be wearing the vest for longer. And number two, I don't have to keep talking about it because people will be constantly addressing it in stream chat. I can kind of be like, all right, we can focus on the game now. All right. Fair enough. <clears throat> in line with never being content with any amount of praise, here is an example where DSP focuses on the negativity he received instead of the well wishes for his quick recovery from sickness. This is ridiculous because there were some people that were just completely understanding this week and were really nice to me. And I want to say thank you to anyone who was. But on the flip side, you've got the complete asshats who are like, Ugh, Phil's not streaming because he's sick. Oh, what a baby. Or, he doesn't care. He's like, what the fuck? I am sitting here Christmas week. You know, this week that I sp plan to spend with Cat and have special time and put on all these special events for all of you. I'm with some of the worst I've ever felt in the past few years being sick. People got to be negative dicks about it. Like, what the fuck? I just don't understand people. Like, how can you be like that? Number 14. Covert narcissists love being difficult people to deal with. They think it makes them outspoken, truthful, and it speaks for their strong character, when all it does is making them appear unfriendly, stubborn, and spiteful. Worse than that, many seem to enjoy it too. So we think of grandiose and vulnerable narcissism. Both of these types of narcissism would have anger, a tendency to be uncooperative, a manipulation component, being cold, antagonistic, and hostile. You see this sense of relief or satisfaction when the narcissist says something hurtful, or they recount how they said something hurtful in the past. The remark was not made because it was logical or appropriate, but for pleasure, as they're saying it or as they're remembering that they said it and talking about it. You see, again, this sense of relief on their face, kind of this subtle smile sometimes. Like even just the memory of it brings a little bit of joy. DSP loves to insult developers. But the idiots who made this game are that fucking stupid. Anyone who worked on that fucking broken ass V Ken literally should never be employed again making fighting games. Like they should never even be allowed to touch a keyboard that has to do with a fighting game. I mean, you have to be the dumbest motherfucker on the planet to think that is valid gameplay. Lose. We lose by one. Go fuck yourself, Treyar. Fuck you. Off. Infinity War, go fuck yourself. You guys fucking suck. Serious morons. His viewers? Sauce Walk is so angry that I'm checking my phone. He's super angry. He's incredibly frustrated and upset that I would check my phone during a stream. <laughs> ah, does this torture you, Sauce Walker? Does this bother you? <laughs> I'm interacting with a fun audience, and you're giving me money. Running in circles, he says. I'm not going to be running in circles. <laughs> I'm going to keep your money, and I'm going to enjoy it. In fact, on Tuesday, when I go out with my wife, I'm going to spend your money. And I'm going to laugh at when I'm doing it. I'm going to say, that was that asshole's money. Here's five. Here's ten. Here's fifteen. <laughs> you fucking idiot. Okay, thanks for the five dollars, stupid. Alrighty. Luther Cujo has subscribed for two months in a row, 13 total. So, been a pretty, uh, so for pretty much 13 months, that's cool. I won't watch the Borderlands 3 playthrough since you won't turn on the Twitch extension so you can interact with chat. Good. Good. Good for you. Miss out on the Borderlands 3 playthrough. That's your loss, not mine. <laughs> Sucker! Blah! Okay. And even other content creators. You're using stuff going on in my life that's none of your fucking business for your personal benefit. You're a scumbag, okay? You are. You're a scumbag. You take people's plights, you take people's bad situations, and you turn them into dramatic, toxic content for your own channels and streams, and you think that that's something that's beneficial to the planet. It's not. Nothing you do is beneficial to the planet. All right? It's toxic garbage. It doesn't belong on YouTube. It doesn't belong on the planet at all. It shouldn't exist, all right? Even if Rich said something positive about me, in a moment's notice, if it would benefit him, he would flip it and turn it and make it negative again just to shit on me for his own personal benefit. That's the kind of person he is. That's the kind of person he's always been on YouTube. It ain't gonna change. In fact, just fuck off in general. <laughs> 
just don't exist. Seriously. Go away and stop making content, and guess what? You'd affect nothing in any negative way whatsoever. The world would still keep fucking turning tomorrow. Disagreeable men won't do anything they don't want to do. They just say, up yours. I'll go home and play video games. Are you with you? I'm not listening to your stupid classes. And why should I work for you? I'll just go have fun. I'll do my own thing. Side note. Researchers Nicholas Holtzman and Michael Stroop found that subjects who scored higher in narcissism engaged in more disagreeable verbal behaviors, arguing and cursing more, and using more sexual language than their more modest counterparts. Additionally, they found that many narcissists feel justified in being mean to people. Number 15. Neuroticism is defined as the proclivity for experiencing negative feelings such as depressed mood, anxiety, worry, fear, frustration, or envy. Since covert narcissists convince themselves of their grandiosity, they constantly have to deal with the thought that the world never realized their greatness. Because this individual's neuroticism and painful uh, shyness and self-awareness inhibits their ability to perform, to be a winner. They struggle with rational thinking. The emotions of the narcissist serve to protect them, but this comes at the cost of logical thought. Now, sometimes on issues unrelated to their feelings of self-worth, narcissists can be quite rational. What we really see here is inconsistency. One cannot count on the narcissist to be rational in any given situation. This also connects back to the idea that there is a risk in trusting a narcissist. This becomes evident by how DSP has lost his ability for self-improvement. This bolsters his victimhood. He either has no time or no money for anything. So it's like, imagine this, you know, playing the game, streaming, got to upload, run out, buy the food, come home, film the DSP tries and get the DSP tries and editing, set up for the next stream, jump right to the next stream. It's hectic as shit. <clears throat> and it's really annoying because I don't even get a chance to catch my breath. If you were just invest in PC gaming, you'd be getting so much more out of it. I don't have money to do 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 it. DSP constantly proclaims how nervous he is about almost everything. Now, things are getting better, and I'm excited, and I'm incredibly terrified about what's going to happen with this tax situation. Like, I'm really worried that, like, I'm going to get slammed with penalties, and the government's going to demand money I don't have. And now what's going to happen? You know, I'm, I am. I'm really fucking nervous about it. So I'm hoping what is the best course of action? I don't know. Can I make enough money on Twitch to support myself? Right now, I'm telling you guys, I'm making a lot of money on YouTube. And now that that's gone, I'm very, 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 very nervous about the future. Okay. Um, I'll be honest. I was like, wow, I was nervous because... Number one, we really didn't hit it. By the time that normally I would have ended my stream, we didn't hit it last night, okay? So it was just coincidence. He is also someone to get discouraged and frustrated quickly. Instant headshot. Just think about that. Instant headshot. I had full 150 health and double level two armor and he instantly headshot me and killed me. Great game. Bye. What the f instant death again? Again? Instant death again. So fuck this game. It's a piece of fucking shit. I hate it. I really do. I detest it. I got completely cheated. Fuck this piece of shit game. Seriously. All right. That was amazing. Uh, thanks everyone for watching tonight's garbage stream of a garbage game that crashes repeatedly and is a piece of fucking garbage. Number 16. When they make themselves the center of the universe, it comes with no surprise that narcissists lack the appropriate empathy to connect to other people on an emotional level. Narcissists are just really careless. They say what they want, they do what they want, they have very little care, very little regard for how their words or their actions will impact you. I'm going to be telling you, they just don't care. And there are a few ingredients that sort of come together here to help you understand that. First, and always, is their lack of empathy. They just don't take into account the feelings of other people. And they also have very little self-reflective capacity. They don't stop to think 
about how their behavior or their words might impact somebody else. Well, I'm sorry to hear that you lost your job at Arby's. If you are being serious, that's very sad because, yeah, you know, right now, so many people aren't able to consistently work. I know how lucky I am. And I'm super happy that I have a job too that I also enjoy doing during this very tough time. You know, so I am super grateful. Again, thank you guys for all the support. Now we've got someone posting a giant paragraph saying that I've lost a viewer because I'm hostile to the viewers. Um, I'm doing a pre-stream. <laughs> I'm not even really directly interacting with anyone. I don't know what the hell you're talking about. And it sounds to me like you may have some personal problems to take care of. Uh, so have a nice life. <laughs> wow. Sambuka Chewed again. He said, I got a bonus for my employer. I might also be losing my job. The crazy time. You got a bonus, but you might lose your job. Isn't that kind of like... That's just like me. I got a commendation. I actually got a big commendation at my job. A big special, you know, certificate that said you went above and beyond and then two months later they laid me off. Fucking idiots. Number 17. Covert narcissists often hold other people up to standards they don't hold themselves up to. They maintain double standards. What's good for you is not necessarily good for them or what you're required to do. They don't have to follow through with it. Remember, they don't believe the rules apply to them, and they're actually very hypocritical. They hold other people's feet to the fire about the rules. They just don't follow the rules themselves. One example is how narcissists actually perpetuate frustration in their relationships. Narcissists say that they don't trust you when they have a history of lying, falsely accusing, and manipulating. So essentially, they're trying to beat you to the punch. They're trying to accuse you of something that they do. This really has a defense mechanism feel to it, like projection. They know that they cannot be trusted, so they project that onto others. If they're grandiose, maybe they're fooling themselves into believing they can be trusted and everyone else can't be trusted. If they're vulnerable, they realize that they can't be trusted, but they become superior by believing other people are even less trustworthy. Narcissists just need to be better than everyone else. They don't actually have to be good. DSP does this as well. He acts as if because others betrayed his trust, they shouldn't be trusted, when he operated from a position of low trustworthiness to begin with. Everything to keep the negative attention away from yourself. Why do you think people have stabbed you in the back? Because I'm an easy target. Because I'm an easy target with really no way to retaliate, being that I'm a public persona. And so many people have treated me so shittily in my life and they know that, and they know that basically I have no way to retaliate against anything, so why not, right? If you can get personal gain by stepping on someone's back and crushing them, why not? And that's what it is, people have done that my whole life. Seriously, I mean that, like, so many friendships and relationships where people have just kind of messed with me and fucked with me and used me uh, and, and fucked me over to get their own way, you know? It sucks, but that's, it's literally almost everyone too. <clears throat> that seriously like don't ever feel oh well they apologize and so immediately i just have to bring them back no that's not how it works at all if they wronged you then it's fine that they apologize obviously it's nice that they learn from their mistake but you do not have to just have things magically go back to the way they fucking were it's up to you you know there's people who you know they mess with you and then it's like damn if i bring them back into my life they could be toxic they could continue to be toxic or maybe i don't feel that that apology is genuine you know and you gotta do what's in your best interest you do you gotta do What's in your best interest? It's your call. DSP also wants people to look good for others in the public broadcast, but won't give himself the same respect. Don't, I'm not saying you have to dress up like a super villain, like some of these fucking people, like the EA CEO. At least try to look like a normal fucking human. You may be a jackass in real life. At least do some. At least do something with your beard. You know, don't look like a fucking unkept asshole. So since I'm actually gonna be in front of real people, uh, that's when I shave. So there you go. You know, I. I Streaming on the internet on a tiny webcam, not a big deal. Actually going out, I don't want to look like a bum when I'm with my wife, so there you go. DSP evidently blames a lot of outside factors for his misfortunes, but scolds an imaginary crowd for doing the exact same thing he does. Why in, on, on this planet do we have to always play the blame game? I, this is actually something unrelated, but why do we have to do this? When something goes wrong, there's always got to be a finger to point and someone who has to be responsible afterward. Maybe things are just fucked up sometimes. You ever think of that? Maybe things, though, this isn't a land of lollipops and fucking rainbows. Number 18. 
resulting from the lack of understanding of other people's emotions is a poor understanding of personal boundaries. Covert narcissists will often meddle with private affairs which are of zero concern to others or the narcissist themselves. Poor boundaries is such a classical manifestation of antagonistic patterns like narcissistic personality styles or narcissistic personality disorder. Poor boundaries happen when a person goes over a line that's really not appropriate. And believe it or not, poor boundaries can be found in any relationship. Just because you're in an intimate relationship with someone doesn't mean there can't be poor boundaries. For example, you may have a sensitive work file on your desk and your partner starts flipping through it. That's a poor boundary. Um, certainly a, a friend asking you questions about your life that you're not ready to answer, that's a poor boundary. When DSB talked about the medical issue of his ex fiance he evidently overstepped the boundary. I don't care if she gave him permission for it. It is common decency to let the afflicted person talk and not let someone else talk for you. Now, Leanna has a history of doing this, uh, having these attacks. It's not her fault or whatever. She just had it in her life. She's had a bunch of them. Um, and she just happened to have a really bad one at work today. It's happened before. And if it's at home, usually there's no problem. We can get her to calm down or whatever. But at this time, it happened in the middle of a work day. She was really stressed out, apparently. And boom, it hit her. And basically, it was so bad that no, you know, no one could get her to calm down. And they had to call the paramedics. Obviously, so you're okay. You didn't fall. You didn't hit your head or nothing, right? No. Just, you know, she happens. It sucks because it happens every once in a while. And now this is the worst one she's ever had. So maybe that she has to go see, you know, her doctor and and try to get some kind of thing to take care of it. Because the, the the bottom line is with anxiety attacks, they suck. The reason they suck is there's really no way to cure them. For the next clip, I have to break my own rule because it is a clip from before DSP's move to Renton. I hope you can forgive me just this once. My parents were being overprotective. I'll tell you why. Because they were having problems with their marriage. I know I've never really talked about this publicly before. I will right now. This is real and from the heart. They were having problems with their marriage at the time when I was in high school. They may or may not have cheated on each other. I don't know or care because it's not my fucking business and I don't give a shit what they did, right? But what they decided to do, they decided to put me in the middle of it and make me the center of the issue. DSP's interactions with Rambo post-move were a disaster. In this clip, he, under false pretenses, got Rambo to text to him to get a response only to break his own promise of don't worry about cameras and read his private texts for everyone to hear on camera. You know, I'm, I told you guys I'm the realest person on the internet. I got nothing to hide. I'm going to tell you exactly what we talked about in, on, uh, via text. And basically I said... Uh, here you go. I said, hey, John, I hope you're doing well. Haven't heard from you recently. I like to catch up with you, you know, off camera. Don't worry about any filming. I just want to hear how you're doing. I, we haven't talked in a while and it feels weird to me. I knew you had schnozzle going on, but when you didn't respond at all to my text last week, it felt like something may be wrong. Just let me know. No pressure. I want to know where we stand and that you're okay. And then John did respond this morning and he said, hey, you're going to have to count, count me out for a while. I need to get my money together so that I can move to a better place. YouTube stuff isn't going to help me with that. I'm around most nights if you ever want to call. So I did respond to him and I said, all right, in the next couple days, I'll try to squeeze in a time when I can call. I know there's a big time zone difference. But the bottom line is it sounds to me like John is just not interested in doing anything on YouTube right now. Um... Number 19. Covert narcissists hate proactively looking for entertainment. As with many things in their life, they demand it to be delivered to their doorstep instead of them searching for it. Okay. And a lot of chronic boredom. And they expect the world to entertain them. Now that we're back to covert narcissists, that they expect to be entertained. Now your overt narcissist is also like this as well, is they expect the world to entertain them. Well, I'm bored, so do something I like. Uh, we're supposed to seek out what we like on our own. That's because we know that we like it. These folks don't don't do that. They have chronic boredom. Entertain me. Keep me interested because that's your job. Otherwise, I am the most bored and I suffer the most. Evidently, DSP loves to tell people that they should talk to him and not the other way around to make his streams more interesting. I haven't talked to chat in ages. No one in chat's talking to me. So why would I talk to you guys? Everyone's ignoring the game for some reason, which I don't understand. Well, input job, if you think this is getting a little boring, why don't you talk to me or ask me a question? <coughs> or interact with me to make it more interesting. Instead of just sitting there complaining that it's boring. 
People in the stream chat aren't really talking that much. And what they're talking about has nothing to do with the game. And no one's asking me questions. So I'm completely disconnected with what's going on in the stream chat. And this game's very boring if you're not having interactions. It's, like, really boring. Sometimes he's so bored, he starts looking at his phone for extended periods of time. Where I get on top of my soapbox, huh? Okay. He might even be so tuned out at some point that he doesn't care about falling asleep on stream. Oh my god. <sighs> cool zero, that's me being sarcastic by the way. You could run. Wherever you go, people will find you if they want to badly enough. And for this they want blood. But you and Mikhail, you have so much history. Sure. Well, I killed the boy, so they want me to. No. I told them you were a hired gun. Huh. And they said, as long as you were the one to kill him, you'd be spared. <laughs> the... so that... Number 20. It's virtually impossible for a narcissist who's constantly projecting to turn around, look at themselves, and question their own behavior. Another perspective is the narcissist has not developed a sense of introspection. To them, the world is, is what you see out there. Uh, they, they look only at measurables. Did you do this correctly? Did you do this incorrectly? Uh, they'll focus on the what or the how or the should, but they don't focus on the why. The introspective person says, well, as we go through our interactions with each other, let's have a real well-developed understanding of why we do what we do. The narcissist is like, nah, I don't need to think that way. Just do what I tell you to do, because that's the way they've learned to think. They fixate on the imperfections of others. The narcissist is always paying attention to other people's mistakes, eager to offer their unsolicited, and almost always unhelpful advice. When confronted with their own shortcomings, they get defensive and double down on their criticisms. So we see that even more rage and anger comes out when they're confronted with their own problems, when they're confronted with the reality that they're not really better than anyone else. I, I did nothing wrong. I did everything correct. I did nothing wrong. Like, the thing is in life, and I've certainly learned this over the years, okay, is in order to be a good winner, you have to know how to be a good loser. And you don't, you never learn anything and get better by winning constantly. It's the true, this is actually, I actually was just talking with, with Kat about this the other day. It's funny because the truth of the matter is, this is, a, this is a huge commentary on like YouTubers. Just because people watch doesn't mean what you're doing is meaningful or good, right? Just because people watch you do horrible things on YouTube, like drama videos, toxic content, stealing other people's content, insulting people constantly, or acting like a fool, it doesn't mean that you're putting out anything of quality or that you should be. Everybody's it's just that people are just kids. staring at you because you look so fucking stupid. It's true. Absolutely 100% true. Number 21. Covert narcissists offer quite a lot of time, mental efforts, and credibility for keeping up their self-deception. Interestingly, the narcissist is equally comfortable regardless of their actual position because they have built a fantasy in their mind. So from their perspective, they can't have their position lowered. They don't sense the damage to the reputation. They don't sense how they are hurting themselves by hurting others. For example, one can imagine a scenario where a narcissist is accused and convicted of a crime. In response to this, they make a false allegation about their accuser, and that accuser is subsequently convicted of a crime as well. So both the narcissist and the accuser end up in prison. Shortly after arriving in prison, the narcissist says, this place isn't so bad. This was my plan all along. I've always wanted to be in prison, right? So they take what's clearly a negative and turn it into a positive. Again, their actual position doesn't really seem relevant. It's all what they think about themselves. And narcissists are really good 
about lying to themselves. Actual success or failure doesn't matter as much when somebody can deceive themselves. In that skill, the narcissist is truly great. The only person a narcissist really needs to deceive is themselves. They try to deceive others, but again, they only need to lie to themselves. And of course, they need to believe those lies. The reasons that people still hate on me today have nothing whatsoever to do with anything legit. Back in the day, maybe they had an argument. <laughs> today, it's just bullshit. It's just them doing it for the sake of doing it for popularity, for drama, so they get attention, or otherwise just because they're nuts. There's no, no valid reason to hate against someone like me anymore. I was, at one point, 100% positively thought of. Busted his fucking ass on a daily basis to make sure that I had fun content for you out there. And I was the one who did everything by himself, grassroots, from the ground up, built who I am and what I am on the internet without any help from anyone fucking else. Um, you know? And it's crazy. It's crazy that I have remained as successful as I am, in my opinion. That I could still do this for a living. It's insane that I, I'm this successful in my opinion but it's it's definitely a, a success story for sure so that's a good thing i know what i'm doing i've been around the block you know what i mean i've talked so much on microphone for the last 10 freaking years that i've pretty much mastered it heresy that spot is reserved for hostage negotiators these people save lives by choosing the right words and tone of voice number 22 why listen, when you can just talk about yourself? Covert narcissists are not interested in your daily events, but they're eager to tell you everything about theirs, especially if you didn't ask. The next associate characteristic is not being a good listener. This is fairly common with NPD, and of course, we know that with NPD, there is a lack of empathy in many instances, and sometimes this and other factors translate into not listening well. Sometimes we see with individuals with NPD, they appear to listen, but then when they respond, they respond with information about themselves. So as somebody's talking, they're really calculating what they can say about themselves to make themselves look better, to fish for compliments, or to otherwise seem more important and seem superior. In the following clip, DSP takes a stunning five minutes of rambling before he answers the original question posed. Fatal Skills asks the following. Um, what si oh, he says, what's up, Phil? Curious, what size TV do you play on? I always wonder what you see on your end. Well, a little bit of, little bit of history. Just by, like, you would think they would say on it? Of course it doesn't, right? It doesn't say on it what it is. You have to bring out a freaking tape measure and start measuring the damn thing. But I'm pretty sure it's uh, 42 inches, okay? On another occasion, he doesn't even answer the question. Luna says, will you be playing the new Call of Duty Battle Royale? From what I'm to understand, it's not even really like a normal Battle Royale. Like, it's weird, it's got these gimmicks to it. As a Timbo Slice was telling me the other day, he's like, it's really not like a normal Battle Royale. They're kind of really... Oh, look at this. So this is Renegade. Good luck, good work with that Corian, man. I understand you have an arrangement. Sometimes, he just completely digresses from the original topic. In this example, DSP turns the topic away from notifications on comments are bad to why did I turn off comments? Notifications on comments on YouTube. Like, YouTube is, is literally getting worse and worse every single fucking day. I'm not sure what you mean by that. You know, I, 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 the reason I can't really attest to it is because I don't know anything about the comment system on YouTube. I haven't used it in almost two years and... Quite frankly, when I did use it, it was a waste of time anyway. Like, it was just toxic and, and unmoddable and just to make it a waste of time. It's hilarious because, you know, when I didn't, when I used to have YouTube comments running, okay, um, basically it got so disgustingly bad and toxic that, that my actual viewers and fans who were there for positive stuff asked me to turn them off. They actually said, Phil, just turn them off, you know? They're so, they're so gross. Number 23. With all their petulance and stubbornness, narcissists are often regarded as immature. Narcissists do not have depth. This is really one of the more frustrating elements for a lot of people. Even though we think of narcissism as protecting a fragile ego, that doesn't automatically mean the ego of the narcissist is complex. 
they're not necessarily protecting a sensitive inner self. Often when people do reach the core of the narcissist, they find it to be hollow and immature. In a sense, it's like the narcissist became stunted at an earlier stage of development, like they're trapped with the mentality of a child or an adolescent. Sometimes people hold out hope for a deep and meaningful relationship with the narcissist only to come to the realization that even without the narcissism, this may be impossible. Bobby Bureau just did a five sub bomb. Congrats to those who just got a random sub. It's bum bum smelly yum yum. <laughs> What the fuck? <laughs> bum bum smelly yum yum. Oh, piece of shit. Suck my ass. Suck a turd right out of my butt. How about that? Suck it. Suck the turds. <laughs> fuck you. <clears throat> Debauchery. I still remember one of the best quotes he ever did. He's, he's reviewing Dragon's Lair on the NES, and he was like, What if you were in a river of piss? Right? And someone above you, there was a bridge where everyone was taking a shit. He says, what do you do? Do you, do, do, you know, hold your nose and, and do, do, you know, jump in and just go wholeheartedly under the piss? Or do you know, put your head above the air and take on the shit? And I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> I laugh my ass off. Don't get me wrong. I just remember the Bugs Bunny's birthday blowout episode where Bug, he takes a shit on Bugs Bunny. Liquid shit squirts all over Bugs Bunny on camera. I was like, God damn, you know, that was funny as fuck, but it was so, like, over-the-top lewd, crazy humor. And that's kind of the thing that was big back then. Number 24. It doesn't take much to get a covert narcissist triggered. Remember to walk on eggshells around them to not awaken their wrath. So when a narcissist is disappointed, and I'm sure many of you know this from your own histories with them, they do not handle it well. The typical reaction is to throw a tantrum, very much like a three-year-old would. They get very, very angry, very, very dysregulated, and it happens very, very quickly. It can actually be quite unsettling to see it because it happens so fast. Listen, anytime any of us are disappointed, we don't always handle it well. You know, I mean, we might walk into a place and yeah, they don't, they said they would have a reservation at eight and they're like, oh, it's not gonna be till 8.30. And you might be like, ugh. But you can catch yourself and say, all right, I'm gonna go take a walk. I'm gonna have a drink at the bar, whatever it is. But we, odds are most of us would not start screaming. And if we do every so often, we all get moments that we don't get it just right. It's rare, it's not the norm. For a narcissistic person, a disappointment almost invariably brings out those really rageful, sudden kinds of reactions. Couldn't see him at all. My line of sight was fucking blocked, so whatever. Whatever, I had a great run. I had a great run, but I never had a shot on him because he was running around, jumping around like a fucking rabbit. So I never had a shot on him. His invasion game was tight. No, it wasn't. He basically did every fucking stupid possible thing. Running and jumping, and you can't hit anyone running and jumping in this fucking game. <laughs> so stupid. Because what should have happened is he jumps and lands, and then he can't move because he's exhausted because he jumped like an asshole. Instead, in this game, you move full speed like you're a fucking insane athlete. You're bouncing all over the place. Fucking stupid. I should have had that, dude. I should have had that. Especially after those sniping kills, I should have fucking had that shit. Plus, it was bullshit. I did hit him with the fucking sniper shot and he didn't die. And it was a headshot when he was on the ground there and he didn't die, so he must have had level 3 armor or something. He should have been dead. Well, that's it. I don't have uh, enough time for another match now. We only have 10 more minutes that I would have played, so. It was a good session. It made no fucking sense. He's right there. I jump from mid range. I go over him. Here comes the hit. It whips. What? He's right fucking there. The two bodies connect on screen, but my fucking jumping whips. The game's a piece of fucking shit. Dumb fucks who made this game to understand how hitboxes work in a fucking fighting game. A bunch of dumb ass, brainless idiots. Mouth drooling fucking morons who didn't know how to make a fighting game. And just because they got the backing to be Street Fighter 5, everyone has to play the piece of shit. This game fucking sucks. It Round fucking one. sucks. Fight. A pussy quick scope. Another pussy quick scope. Pussy quick scope. Pussy quick scope. I just spawned. I just spawned. There's no skill to that. Zero. Pussy quick scope. Another quick scope. Quick scope. 
all pussy quickscope, no skill at all. None. Zero. Pussy quickscope. This is insane. Pussy quickscope. Pussy quickscope. He wasn't even looking down the site. Pussy quickscope. He spawned behind me. Number 25. As you might expect, covert narcissists hate being denied the things they seek. But instead of dealing with a disappointment maturely, they often like to rage instead. So what is narcissistic rage? Well, this is an anger that we observe frequently with people who are highly narcissistic, including many of those who have narcissistic personality disorder. In the moment when a narcissist is criticized or whatever triggers the reaction, we see that the anger is sudden, irrational, disproportionate to the level of criticism and may involve physical gestures or even aggression. So that's the reactive component. So when the narcissist is criticized, that challenges the narcissism, that protective part. The narcissist compensates for the criticism through rage. Rage allows the narcissist to keep that false self in place, to maintain their own self-deception. The broken, the broken icons that stuck on my HUD are my fault. Fuck you, you dumb shit. Oh my god. I open fire into his body, he survives, I die. Fuck you, Infinity Ward, you fucking suck. Seriously, I fucking hate you. I fucking hate you, you guys are fucking scumbags. Let's go, let's now Peach go. beats me, get the fuck, fuck this fucking game. I just wrecked Peach, she started off after me, she beats me, fuck you. Fuck you, Ghost Games, you dumb fucking ass cuck fucking pieces of fucking shit. You guys couldn't make a fucking video game if someone handed you a completed one. Oh my god, you guys are fucking morons. Rubber Band City. And now for the reveal of the secret, which really isn't a secret. This video is ultimately pointless. Why? Ego syntonicity. Initially, my attentions were to point out narcissistic behavior DSP exhibits and tell him how to improve upon it. But once I started formulating my thoughts for this video, I decided that for two reasons I will refrain from doing so and focus on getting out a message instead. For one, the guy's 38 years old at the point of making this video. He had tons of time, experience and criticism in the limelight of the lol cow community to understand how his behavior is fundamentally dysfunctional and disruptive. If he's as smart as he says he is, he should have figured it out by himself. And two, is simply for my own sanity. No amount of constructive criticism can help a person who believes that their dysfunctional behavior is in line with their self-image. That's what it means to be egocentric. This is different from someone who realized that their way of acting is causing problems for them or others and is in conflict with what they actually desire. I recently had the opportunity to work with someone who suffers from binge eating disorder. I could see from the beginning how deeply sad the person felt because of their uncontrollable behavior and it really left a mark on me how the acceptance of your darker sides is an important part of your journey through life. This person was clearly egodystonic. You can see why narcissists don't feel that way. The primary focus of meaningful self-improvement is the acknowledgement of fault, agreeing with your own inconsistency, meaning that you once thought differently, and commitment to change. Narcissists fail at every one of those stages. They blame mistakes on others or circumstances. They don't think that they should be responsible for something they did in the past because they don't feel that they were the same person. And they abuse something called future faking. It means that they lie about something they want to do in the future to get what they want in the present. To no surprise, they most likely won't deliver on the promise they made and instead just gaslight you with something like, I never said that. You can imagine why narcissists don't exactly show up to be diagnosed or to get help. Why talk to someone about something that you don't believe to be an issue but a healthy part of your personality? 
I feel justified in being mean to people if they're mean to me first. Yes, two wrongs make a right. Minus times minus is plus. You learned that shit in school, and it feels like you didn't pay attention in school. You must be an idiot. I got it all figured out. You're actually a fraud. Even worse is when narcissists sometimes do have to appear for consultations, and believe me, they love missing out more than attending. They spend the time listening to the therapist or consultant, and start to learn about how their behavior can be even more efficient in manipulating or gaslighting people. This is essentially a big risk taking in mental health, as agreeing to counsel a narcissist can backfire in a really bad fashion. Instead of dulling their proverbial blade they used to cut others with, a therapist can help sharpen it instead. I'm not saying that therapy can't help a narcissist out of their narcissism, but the chances for complete or partial recovery are incredibly slim. Narcissists are all about diversion tactics. Keeping you off your game, questioning your own thoughts and memory, they love to confuse others because it makes them easier to manipulate. DSP bloats his sentences with redundancies, tautologies, and filler words to sound smarter than he actually is. It's not even about being superior to others anymore. It's simply enough for him to appear superior. Ironically, he thinks he can appear smarter, but only ends up hurting his own intelligence in the process. He corrects other people's grammar when it's impolite to do so, tells them that's not even English when there's probably just a slight error in sentence structure or a typo, something that happens pretty frequently when you're typing on a keyboard. Not so for valedictorian Phil. He demands accurate English syntax and semantics whenever you address him. Okay. Essentially, let me let me paraphrase this because this is not even in English for those who don't play Minecraft. Electric Sheep Dreams is angry at me. DSP is infamously known for using words incorrectly. Not just common misconceptions, but words and meanings which are way off. He mistakes the terms cold turkey for blind, as in play a game for the first time. I experienced the series for the first time, you know, cold turkey, and people love when I play things for the first time to see what, what they're all about. Uses reactionary when he means reactive. Versus they make you react. See what I mean? Reactionary gameplay versus actually thinking about something going on. Thinks that penultimate means greater than ultimate when it just means second to last. That would be the penultimate. That would be even bigger than the underdog story of Daniel Bryan. That would be like, holy shit. The funny part is that he has been corrected on all of these terms and he still chooses to use them wrong. Tough word ahead. Ultra crepidarianism is another one. Not the word, but its meaning because DSP is someone to talk outside of his circle of knowledge and give unhelpful advice to people. It's a buyer's market for cars, right? The flu is worse than COVID-19. I think you heard enough about that. He also supports positions which go clearly against the evidence. He once told viewers that suicides in Japan are caused by the cramped living situation. His source? People told him back in the FGC days. But there's so many people in Japan, it's insane. It's like, that country is like way overpopulated. It's like, gee, I live in a country, wherever I go, people are packed in like fucking sardines. In order to even get a, a, a one, one bedroom, one bathroom, tiny closet sized apartment is like the cost of a house in the United States. Gee, I wonder why everyone's depressed. I wonder. <laughs> it's not rocket science. Minnow, no, I've not been to Japan, but I know all about it. I've researched it, I know people who have been there. And they've all confirmed exactly what I'm saying. They say, there's way too many people, everything's insanely fucking expensive. It's a really nice place to visit, but you wouldn't want to live there. Yeah, it probably couldn't have anything to do with the high social pressure and bullying, right? I wouldn't trust the guy who talked to a lawyer about copyright and can't tell libel and slander apart afterwards. I actually looked into the law about this, just you know, a few years ago. Talked to a lawyer. And I did some research about this, okay? You can't just say and do whatever you want on the internet. You can't. If you actually are aiming to make someone look bad in a way that is not representative of the truth of the matter, it's considered either defamation or slander depending on the medium. I believe it's slander, I believe is his printed word, and defamation would be everything else like spoken word. Next, he loves to attack people instead of their arguments. He even goes so far as to void the credibility because of one mistake they made. 
Infamous for this is the escort saga lots of detractors, including myself, bought into. Mistakes in judgement are human for DSP, but once his opposition makes a mistake, they should never be trusted again. On one occasion, he shifted the blame to have learned the wrong meaning of rainy day fund, from a change in meaning over the years to the education system who taught me. Face it, he didn't pay attention to what the term meant and didn't feel compelled to look it up before using it. Nothing more. That's what a rainy day fund always was. I was taught that in school. I remember studying the definition of it in fucking school. So maybe it's a different thing today, but that's not what it used to be. When's the last time I was in school? Uh, 2004. DSP once discussed forms of intelligence on his own Q&A show. What a treat that was, let me tell you. Not just that he clearly has no idea what forms of intelligence actually exist. He also only favors those forms he actually has. There's different kinds of intelligence. <clears throat> there's book smarts, there's street smarts, and there's common sense. Okay? <laughs> That's what I feel. There's three core kinds of intelligence that humans can have. What the hell form of intelligence are those anyway? Forms of intelligence I know are fluid, crystallized, verbal, numerical, or emotional, for example. You can find out by simply researching for a bit. And while we're on the topic of intelligence, do you remember the times DSP told his viewers that he actually fared well on intelligence tests? I did, because it was an unrecorded segment of a stream. Like I said, I'm actually, I, even though a lot of the times I play like I'm stupid, I'm actually pretty smart when it comes to logic puzzles and stuff like that. I really am. I know this is nothing that I would never really uh, talk about publicly, and it, obviously you wouldn't see me do logic puzzles on stream or whatever, but I've taken IQ tests before, I've done these kind of logic puzzles before, um, and I usually do really well. Might I suggest he actually lied here? Unless he can provide information about who administered the test, why it was administered, what the name of the test was, and how exactly he scored. I'm not willing to believe anything he tells me about how well he did on any IQ test. The SP also loves to abuse the words logic, logical, and analytical to appear superior in a debate, especially when he argues on the merits of an emotional argument. The people who criticize me the most are not logical. They're not logical humans. They will literally make conspiracy theories up. They will say whatever they want. It doesn't matter what I show you, none of it will prove anything. All right. That, when it's completely out of context and anyone with a logical mind says you're an idiot. So enjoy wasting your time. And for someone who claims to be a logical and rational mature human adult, he sure loves to fall victim to numerous logical fallacies, such as the appeal to normality. Messed up in the head. You would not be a normal person with a happy, robust, healthy life and go to somewhere like that and behave like those people do. Not one of those people is normal. Argument from ignorance? Well, I, I, now I also do things like drink cherry juice and stuff too, which, you know, not that it's scientifically proven, but hey, I've been drinking cherry juice for years now and I haven't had a major flare-up, so obviously it was doing something, all right, so. Assuming fact, not an evidence? I'm not insulting anyone, and I'm certainly not making fun. I'm saying anyone who would do the, the messed up things that people do to me, like stream sniping, are messed up in the head. That's not making fun of them. That's a factual observation. Saying something exists doesn't mean you're insulting it. Circular reasoning? If the things that I did were so grievous, such a grievous, horrible actions, number one, I wouldn't have anyone tune into my streams. Everyone would, would hate me and no one would be here to be supportive to hang out with me. Number two, I'd be banned from Twitch. I'd be banned from YouTube. I'd be banned from the planet. Ergo decido. Uh, no. I'll do how I want. And if you don't like it, you can go fucking watch somebody else or do it yourself. Jesus. False analogy. When you cook food at home, it costs money. You have to pay for food. Now, if I'm out all day, all right? What's the difference if I go and I eat when I'm out and I pay for it when I'm out? Or if I buy groceries and come home and cook the meal, it still costs money. Generalization. Tom says, I love the retro replays you were doing. I'm having fun with it. I like doing retro stuff. It's just sad that some the, the modern audiences, I hate to say this, modern viewing audiences are very biased against it. 
when you play retro stuff modern gamers are like oh it looks outdated the gameplay is outdated they won't give it a shot no true scotsman it's funny how all the gamers on metacritic absolutely loved it critics are just okay with it the opposite of last of us too yes because those critics are idiots they're not real gamers they're morons looking for some insane artistic vision instead of a good fucking video game they shouldn't have jobs they shouldn't poisoning the well mingo domingo is now to me dollar now listen to what he's trying to do listen to how stupid this guy thinks i am He's trying to put me into a trap. So let's read word for word what he says. Red herring. Someone actually just sent me a dollar and said, Tevin has given more back to his fans and to charity than you ever have, and you make more money than him. He breaks the law. You literally might as well say, yeah, well, the drug dealer down the fucking street, you know, donates to charity and does nice things for his customers. He breaks the law. Relative privation. Truth of the matter is, the coronavirus is not an epidemic. The flu virus is more dangerous than the coronavirus. More people worldwide are dying of the flu than coronavirus. The flu is a bigger problem. And two wrongs make a right. People insult me every single day a million times, right? All I do is defend myself. So all, if you're saying I shouldn't call him an idiot or a moron, okay, what should I just do? Say, gee, thanks for insulting me. You're, you're, you're really mean. And, you know... At least if, you, if you, you strike back, at least it doesn't feel like you're trying to be victim complex constantly, because I'm not. And don't forget that he actually believes that such a thing as a silent majority exists. You get to hear it that much, because, like I said, I really feel that like the people who like my content are a silent majority. There's obviously tons of people who watch my stuff. Right now, there's thousands of people watching this playthrough on YouTube, which is awesome, because I don't usually get that much viewership. A lot of speech is implicit when it comes to narcissists. We're only $5 into the Vesco, and have 30 minutes left, guys. Make no mistake, that shit is implicit begging. I want you to hit the goal in the next 30 minutes is the implied speech. I have bills to pay, so please tip me today. It's the same as some panhandler approaching me asking for change because he wants to buy food. Whenever DSP utters the word, I never lie, or it's negation, I always tell the truth. He actually means, whatever I say should become the truth. As such, Apologies from narcissists are hollow and reek of non-committal, as an actual apology is a sign of weakness and inferiority to them. I told you that narcissists love future faking. Committing to change after an apology is a facet of this. An apology accepted for DSP means that he can return to the status quo. He doesn't have to change and basically got a free pass to repeat wrongful behavior in the future. The same way Rambo told people that he made DSP apologize to him multiple times, but Phil never changed his behavior afterwards and thought he was free to make the same mistake later on. When other people face problems in their life, it's fobbed off with a simple, that sucks, or life is tough. Lack of empathy or not, can he not try a little harder to feel bad for other people? I guess that little bit of faking more empathy is too much to ask for. But once DSP faces issues, it's a huge deal and everyone mistreated him, nobody helped him, Everyone was incompetent, and he knows better than anyone. The Liana Hospital saga proves this. DSP's grandiosity at this point could be bigger than the sun when he stated that the loss of life in his earlier years would have some kind of lasting ripple effect across the entire globe. Mine is that I almost died. The door impacted to within about an inch of my head, so I almost ate it. Um, and you know, huh. man, that would have been a different a different scenario for the world, huh? If I never existed uh, as a content creator and stuff, you know, a lot of things would have been different, I guess. These are methods for madness. Evidently, the narcissist won't drive themselves insane. But everyone who stops to think about these issues for long enough and has the capacity for empathy or even wants to help someone like this will inevitably drag themselves into a maelstrom of reproach and regret. So... When you're left with an individual refusing help from any angle of attack, is there anything you can do? It comes down to a simple math equation. And all you have to do is to remove yourself from that equation. After all what you just heard, do you still believe you can help a narcissist to be not narcissistic? I applaud your determination if you do. I do seem rather pessimistic about that issue. 
Nature played us all a fool and presented us with a problem which can't be fixed by facing it head on, but by fixing people around it instead. Giving people in the vicinity of a narcissist the vital information of how to deal with them is helping more than trying to make a narcissist change, especially if they don't even acknowledge their issues. The deeply rooted lack of insight a narcissist carries around with them prevents them from facing their issues in any capacity. To invoke bad feelings in a narcissist ends up in projection. The offer of constructive criticism may be accepted, but not transformed into anything tangible. You do good to not try to get involved too much with them, as they will likely drag you down with them once you decide to go serious. Whenever possible, try to avoid them. Give them the widest berth that you can. But sometimes, you don't want to or can't do that. In that case, here are the things that you can do. For once, in your interaction with narcissist, don't do what I just did. Don't try to point out their flawed behavior. I'm not saying that to shield the narcissist, but simply to save you the blood pressure and time. I know there's a big community of people who like to poke DSP constantly, and as long as you keep what should stay on the internet actually on the internet, I take no issue with you. It's all lighthearted fun at the end of the day, which a seemingly overgrown child gets upset over and bans you for, because that is his last refuge of power over you. Even in rare moments of clarity, where DSP is serious about his true feelings, he couldn't tell you why he acts the way he does. This is simply because narcissists don't know their whys. So here's what's unfortunate, gang. They're never going to be able to give you an answer to this question. And whatever answer they give you is going to be so deeply unsatisfying that you're going to be more confused and upset than you were when it began. And there's a simple reason for this. You ready? Narcissists don't know their why. They're actually very unclear on their motivations. Because let me tell you this, because this is where the mind fuck is. They do not wake up in the morning and say, ha, 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 I'm going out to gaslight and then I'm going to do some manipulating and by three o'clock it's time for exploitation and then at seven o'clock I'm going to lie. That's not how they go through the day. They go through their day to do one thing and one thing only and that's to protect their fragile ego and they protect their fragile ego by seeking out validation, being grandiose being really superficial, acting really entitled, and not bothering themselves with the feelings of other people. That's how they protect that insecure, fragile ego. DSP has no insight into his motivations. He doesn't know what drives him. He knows what he wants, fame and money for a supposed hard work he provided, but he doesn't know what makes him act the way he does. The primary goal is to protect his fragile ego. Insecurity defines most of his actions as he ventures through life. Unsure about his future, he stops planning for it and starts to live in the moment. Impulsivity is what follows. Sometimes things don't go the way he wants to. He learns that through manipulation and hostility, he can get through to what he wants and assumes these are healthy human personality traits. He starts projecting negative feelings he experiences onto others in order to cope with them. He notices that it's easier to manipulate people if they think they are alone in their way of thinking. He starts gaslighting them and it just seems to work. I can get away with this, changes to, this is who I've always been, or everyone does this anyway, so why not me? It finds abode in his personality and dictates his behavior from now on. Anyone who dares pointing out his ridiculousness is some lunatic or conspiracy theorist who has got too much time on the hand. What I'm trying to say is that he acts from a position of constant insecurity. Once you start to realize that DSP is essentially out for acknowledgement from people he doesn't know, you realize it's like some kind of drug for him. This is where your first angle of attack lies. Narcissists love when you react. It doesn't matter how you do it, they love it because it gives them the satisfaction of choosing either to manipulate you or it gives them the narcissistic supply they need should you just blindly support them. The only viable method of dealing with this is with indifference. If there's one thing narcissists hate the most, and they hate it to the core, it's indifference. They absolutely cannot stand it 
when people don't give a fuck about them, no matter what they do. They actually get depressed if that happens and they start seeking mental help. Obviously, the depression will improve, but not the narcissism. The social media realm is rife with narcissistic people and many onlookers are oblivious to it. Many excuse it as a strong personality or some kind of show of force. But in this day and age, social media favors those who are narcissistic. It helps climbing the ranks in the hierarchy. You have to understand though that these people are not inherently evil. They don't actively seek to hurt others, but sometimes seek revenge for perceived hurt. That they may not set out to hurt you. They just don't care enough to think about whether their behavior actually will hurt you. And after they do hurt you, they don't really care that they did hurt you. And all of that can really leave you feeling a bit confused. Narcissists are not predators. They are more a force of nature, hurting people around them without even realizing it. Being surprised by what the narcissist says gives them power. Being outraged by what they do gives them power. So should we just ignore them? Not quite. Respond, but don't react is the best way if you have to engage with someone like this. Reaction is what the narcissist seeks. It confirms that they can still manage to manipulate people into what they want. By choosing to not argue on the merits of what the narcissist says and staying true to your intentions without diversion will not often reward you with results, but with more sanity than trying to argue the countless insults and projection thrown your way. Another big part in successfully dealing with them is stopping to excuse their ridiculous behavior. As I said before, an apology is not an apology for a narcissist. For them, it means that I can repeat the same manipulation later on. Most of us issue second chances with zeal. Our storytelling in our culture is immersed in tales of hope, redemption and forgiveness. And while that's all very healthy, in the wrong hands, hope and forgiveness may not represent an opportunity for growth or change or restoration, but rather permission to just keep things going as they are. Because with narcissists, forgiveness is interpreted as, hey, let's just keep the status quo. When it's used as a rationalization, when their backstory, when their history is conveniently pulled out as an excuse for their bad behavior, this is a great chance for you to gracefully exit in a very compassionate way and say, I'm sorry that happened to them, not my problem. Because that's the key you've got to remember. You're not responsible for their history and nothing you do can undo that history for them. So many people buy into the fairy tale myth that if I love this person enough, if I'm good enough to them, if I sit here and listen to them the way their parents didn't, then that will clean the slate and all of that bad stuff will go away and they'll fall into the warmth of my love and they'll get it. Kind of not how it goes. Accept apologies of people who actually mean it, deserve it and show the commitment for change. Don't excuse some facetious, sorry you felt that way, but I might repeat that mistake later on, so please excuse me now. Pessimistic as I might be, the truth is that narcissism is a pattern which is highly resistant to change and likely won't change on its own. Rule number one, and live by this one, narcissists do not change. So either manage your expectations if you plan on staying in the relationship or get out. However, just because you understand them doesn't mean that the narcissist's behavior is going to change. The most painful realization is that narcissistic patterns are just not that amenable to change. At a minimum, for any change to occur, the narcissist has to recognize the harmful pattern of their behavior, then they have to want to change it, and then they have to put in the daily work of change. There is a small number of cases where that's kind of happened, but under conditions of stress and frustration, the usual issues of rage will pop up, the rubber band of personality returns to its usual shape and size, even with therapy, there is little to no hope that someone like DSP can change. Adjust your expectations accordingly. Expect that DSP will say or do something outrageous from time to time to keep the attention up and keep his interactions buzzing. 
Expect him to wear ridiculous pieces of clothing, which promise him more income. Expect him to have misinformed opinions on topics of current public relevance. Expect him to show no empathy and act impulsive. Expect him to look for his narcissistic supply. Expect him to attempt to manipulate you. There's always going to be another obstacle he has to overcome. Another situation he can bolster his victimhood with. Another lie to gaslight his viewers with. But too much of it is never enough for him. Everything for just another dose of that sweet, sweet public admiration. A relationship with a narcissist is a gradual indoctrination. You slowly become inured to their lack of empathy, their tantrums, their rage, their insults, and their entitlement, their lies and their challenges to your reality. Their insulting words slowly become your self-talk. And before you know it, your new mantra becomes, I am not enough. Eventually, it comes down to this. DSP is like an Indian tech support scammer to me. He'll lure you in under false pretenses, create an illusion of your necessity to help by throwing money at a problem, and tries to convince you with meaningless babble and bloated speech even he himself doesn't understand, abuses you emotionally should you prove difficult to deal with, and finally dismiss you if you're of no help to him. He's not a good streamer. He's not a good entertainer. He sucks at keeping an audience entertained by himself. Some people enjoy him anyway. Some people really fucking hate his guts. And most of the people don't even fucking care. Some supporters risk an arm and a leg to send DSP gifts they will receive no recognition for. Some detractors will risk time in jail for bringing this internet feud into real life. It's a weird fucking dynamic and I enjoyed being part of it for at least some time. But I have to acknowledge that it ultimately leads nowhere. I'm not even disappointed. I had and will have tons of laughs because of him, for all the wrong reasons. With DSP, there just is no goal. Only pointing and laughing. My prognosis? The guy won't ever change. And if he does, it's just because something forces him to. There's just no drive to be creative or interesting. Just do same shit different day and expect things to be different by the time the next game releases. No talent. No imagination. Hype up game. Play game. Tell people that game sucks. Buy a sequel anyway. This is DSP's last resort. He makes the most money doing this than he has ever in his life. People enable him and many more dislike him. This could be the slowest burn the world has ever witnessed. The most interesting DSP has been when shit actually happens to him. Jim Can Swim recently offered a great explanation as to why people are naturally drawn to disasters, which I feel like, to some degree, also applies to internet lol cows, even though a greater part can be explained by morbid curiosity and sheer entertainment. And the reasoning is that destruction commands our attention in a way that nothing else can. It's quite simply human nature to be drawn to disaster. And the scientific explanation is that it actually triggers our survival instincts. It's recognized as a reflex response, occurs subconsciously, and is sometimes referred to as the train wreck theory. It stimulates our brain to analyze and interpret the information in front of us, and then evaluate this information to see if it is a threat to you or not. If it's not a threat, we feel a mild sense of relief. But if it is a threat, our brains immediately decide whether you should face it or run away from it. Each time this system takes effect, it builds a preventative mechanism for avoiding danger altogether in the future, and also develops our ability to process the same type of information faster and in a more accurate manner. And most importantly, don't waste your time trying to find out why DSP does the things that he does. I'm glad I could save you some time trying to wrap your head around it, because that shit took me more than a year to find a satisfactory answer for. But don't think of me like I'm doing God's work or some shit, because I'm not. My morbid curiosity was interested in this specific lol cow, and I just wanted to understand why he's so unpopular. And I think I found my answer, which I wanted to share with you. But alas, of course, 
I might be wrong about all of this. I'm certainly not saying this is the ultimate psychoanalysis of Philip Paul Bernal, which it actually isn't because I've told you as much in the disclaimer. DSP might actually not be a narcissist. One possible other explanation is that DSP simply chooses to behave like a narcissist. It is entirely possible, but I would question why. Another explanation could be that I'm just missing the forest for the trees. Maybe there's a greater issue with him that I'm just not seeing. Maybe I'm just completely wrong about all of this. Maybe this is just normal behavior for someone like him. I'm reminding you again, this entire video is abductive reasoning. An incomplete set of observations is used to infer to the simplest, most likely explanation, which is not necessarily true. Maybe someone else has a better explanation for his behavior. Maybe DSP's just incredibly egotistical and I'm just some overzealous nitwit blinded by confirmation bias. Feel free to share your thoughts with me if you wish to do so. Before I conclude, I wanted to leave you with one final clip from DSP. I found it recently through the help of another detractor Twitter. It's from shortly before the move. You've already seen it in the poor boundaries section of part 2, but now I'm going to play the clip in full. Here, he describes his relationship with his parents and explains to his audience how his mother treated him. They were having problems with their marriage at the time when I was in high school. They may or may not have cheated on each other. I don't know or care because it's not my fucking business and I don't give a shit what they did, right? But what they decided to do, they decided to put me in the middle of it and make me the center of the issue. So, well, we hate each other's guts. Look what you're doing. You're going to tear our family apart. What's going to happen to Phil because of this and that? And literally, they made me the center of it when really I had nothing to fucking do with it. It was those two. So, for, no, you can't go out with your friends. You got to stay home and save your money and do what we tell you and this or that. And basically, they made me more like an object than anything else in their ongoing marital battle that they had when I was in high school. You're, you know, go ahead, but we don't approve of what you're doing and you're wasting your life and your money, and it was like never good enough for them, right? They were always super over-disciplined. My parents trusted me enough to buy me a car, and I got into a car accident in it. It wasn't my fault, but it ended up being my fault because the guy who was at fault, who swerved in front of me and almost ran me off the road, took off. So there was no, I didn't get to see his license plate, no one got a witness, so they said, oh, you lost control of your car. I'm like, no, this guy almost hit me, but they wrote it off as it was my fault. The car got totaled, all right? The first thing my mom says to me in the hospital is not, are you okay? Uh, oh my God, what happened? No. Why did you disobey my wishes and drive on that highway? I told you not to. And at that point, I said, you know what? Fuck this. Because if you're going to make life about you and not about me anymore, I don't care. I watched this clip and I could hear the click in my head. Suddenly, it started to all make sense. When I started to learn about narcissism, Many, many mental health care professionals told me that narcissists are likely a result of simultaneous overvaluation, conditional love, and inadequate validation from their parents. Even though I know this is possibly just a 1% window into the relationship DSP and his mother had, I'd risk going out on a huge limb that his relationship with his mother might have been riddled with similar emotional conflicts as seen in this clip. Maybe this is a hint for something. But maybe I'm just stupid and it's just a shot in the dark. Anyway, I'm at my wit's end and at the end of this video as well. Thank you for watching or listening if you made it this far. If you're interested in learning more about narcissism, Dr. Todd Grande, Dr. Les Carter and Dr. Ramani Dravasala offer a big library of YouTube videos and discuss different topics relating to narcissism for further research. One final question remains. How does one manage to appease the hunger of an insatiable ego when there is nothing left to give? I gave it all away And now has come the day There's nothing left to give Yeah